Minority Leader from New York, Chuck Schumer, made a series of demands for Israel during a speech on the Senate floor Thursday. And one of those included calling for new elections in the Jewish state. Danny Dannon is a member of the Israeli Knesset. He weighs in on Fox News. We, we were shocked, and I say we because it was from left to right. People were shocked to hear those words of Senator Schumer because one of the core issues that we have in common with the U.S. is democracy, the value of democracy. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is attending the United Nations Commission on Narcotic Drugs to stress that ending drug addiction is a global effort. Blinken addressing the organization in Vienna. Fulfilling the mission of this institution is critical to the security, to the prosperity, to the health of the American people, just as it is to people of all of our nations. The 2024 election is expected to be a rematch between former President Donald Trump and President Joe Biden. South Carolina Republican Senator Tim Scott on Fox News predicts it will be another four years for the former president. We are going to win because we have the right candidate with a record all right on every single issue that matters to Americans. As a crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border continues, city leaders in Denver, Colorado, and New York City are now asking private citizens to host illegal immigrants in their homes. For USA News, I'm Tim Berg. Hi, I'm Ronnie Deutsch, and if you or your business owe money to the IRS, I've got great news for you. Tax laws have changed. Billions of dollars are earmarked for IRS Fresh Start programs. And if you qualify, you can literally save tens of thousands of dollars. Listen, I know what you're going through. Call me if you want to speak with a tax attorney or tax professional for free. 800-284-9275. That's 800-284-9275. You deserve extraordinary care close to home. From primary care to advanced specialties right here in Sullivan and access to all that BJC Healthcare has to offer. We're here to provide the care you need. Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital and BJC Healthcare. Care that is comprehensive, coordinated, and completely about you. Learn more at MissouriBaptistSullivan.org. Missouri Net News, I'm Marshall Griffin. The Missouri House has passed a bill that looks to amend the state constitution by making the Jackson County Assessor an elected position. If the bill from Blue Springs Republican Dan Stacy passes the General Assembly, it'll go to voters on a statewide ballot. Jackson County is the only Tartar County in Missouri that has an appointed assessor position rather than an elected one. The county's assessments have been the subject of frustration for months as property values have gone up by nearly 40 percent since 2021. Aside from receiving criticism from the state auditor, it's also the subject of a lawsuit filed by the Attorney General. The legislation heads to the Senate for consideration. Some of the preliminary work to expand I-70 to six lanes across Missouri will begin tonight, weather pending. Work crews will begin drilling core samples of older pavement and geology underneath the east and westbound lanes of I-70 between Columbia and Kingdom City. MoDOT Director Patrick McKenna says planning and preparations are moving quickly. To move to the point where we've got permitting, where we've got um, a process in place, enough on the engineering, enough um, information to move an interstate project. This is only six months from when the um, when last year's budget bill was signed into law. Meanwhile, core drilling work is scheduled for 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Monday through Friday for the next six weeks. Site selection is underway in Missouri for a new natural gas plant for the state's electric cooperatives. To meet growing demand, the co-ops are building a new plant at Ripley Energy Center in Oklahoma and another inside Missouri. Caleb Jones is CEO of the state's electric cooperatives. Technology has changed with agriculture and also the ability to have electricity is, has really caused a lot of, of growth in rural areas. People now having the same resources available they would have in town but want a better way of life or moving out to rural areas. So we've certainly seen an increase not just in population but also energy load too. Electric cooperatives maintain 130,000 miles of power lines in rural Missouri to their member owners. This is Missouri Net. Not everyone recognizes that they might have a gambling problem. How do you know if gambling is a problem for you? Ask yourself if either or both of the following questions are accurate. Have you felt the need to bet more and more money? Have you ever lied to people important to you about how much you gambled? If your answer is yes to either of these questions, free help is available. Call 1-888-BETS-OFF for more information. We are strong. We are resilient. 
and we will get through this together. But these are stressful times, and it's important to also practice good self-care. It's normal to feel overwhelmed, anxious, or afraid, but there is hope. Reach out to someone, connect with your friends, stay in touch with your community, and know that you are not alone. Learn more at wearebroadcasters.com slash hope. Furnished by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. This is the Missouri Military Minute. I'm Brett Martin. St. Joseph will devote more time and energy advocating for the Air National Guard 139th Airlift Group. St. Joseph Chamber of Commerce President Natalie Hahn says the chamber is partnering with Community Alliance to lobby on behalf of the 139th. Because we know the decision regarding the J model airplanes is going to come from D.C., but there are also some things that we could do at the state level, and really there are some things that we could do locally to bring more awareness to the 139th. Hahn says the community cannot afford to be naive about the fact that the 139th was not included among the air bases receiving the upgraded C-130 cargo planes. And, you know, that concern concerns us because if we're the last man standing with the old airplanes and we're not mission ready when we need to be, then we put ourselves at risk. Han says if St. Joseph isn't careful, it's one presidential administration away from losing an airbase. Your 401k is likely one of your most important assets, but it's only one part of a comprehensive retirement strategy. Edward Jones can help you understand how your retirement assets fit into your entire retirement picture so you can work toward meeting your unique retirement goals. Contact me, Donnie Greenwald, your Sullivan Edward Jones Financial Advisor at number 10 First Community Plaza in Sullivan. Edward Jones, member SIPC. We all want to be the best version of ourselves, and Compass Health Network is your preferred provider for all things related to your health and well-being. From primary care and mental health services to pediatric and adult dental procedures, our professional and compassionate staff is here for you. Call us today at 844-853-8937 or visit compasshealthnetwork.org to find a location in your area. Compass Health Network is here to help you reach your health care goals. Looking at our local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. A fatality accident occurred in Washington County at 10.13 p.m. Saturday on Route E near Wicket Road. A 2004 Honda CT750 motorcycle operated by 30-year-old Adam J. Sapp of Irondale traveling west on Route E went out of control off the right side of the roadway, struck a mailbox and overturned. Adam J. Sapp, 30, of Irondale, was pronounced dead at the scene. A passenger, 55-year-old Bonnie J. Sapp of Cadet, Missouri, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Washington County Memorial Hospital by Washington County Ambulance District. The Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.40 p.m. on Sunday in Crawford County near Number 10 Grand Oaks. A 2023 Yamaha motorcycle operated by a 13-year-old juvenile from Sullivan traveled off the right side of the roadway and struck several trees ejecting the driver. The 13-year-old male juvenile from Sullivan suffered serious injuries and was flown to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. At 7.20 p.m. Saturday in Dent County at 119 Highway DD, a go-kart operated by a 7-year-old male juvenile from Rolla made an abrupt turn causing the passenger to be ejected. The passenger, 31-year-old Andrea M. Bowers of Rolla, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Phelps Health for treatment. Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.50 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on northbound Route in near Finney Lake Drive. A 2003 Honda Accord driven by a 16-year-old female juvenile from Villa Ridge was traveling north on Route End too fast for the Kirby Road. Across the center line of the roadway, overcorrected to the right, the vehicle began rotating clockwise, went off the right side of the roadway and overturned several times. The 16-year-old female juvenile driver from Villa Ridge suffered moderate injuries, was taken by Merrimack Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in Washington. A 16-year-old female juvenile passenger suffered serious injuries and was taken by Merrimack Ambulance District to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. There was an accident at 4.08 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on Old Highway K west of Little Indian Creek Road. A 2004 Ford F-150 pickup operated by Stephanie L. Woods, 38 of Lundell, Traveling eastbound on Old Highway K, driver failed to maintain control of the vehicle, went off the left side of the highway. 
Stephanie Woods suffered serious injuries, was taken to Mercy Hospital in Washington by St. Clair Ambulance. She was not wearing her seatbelt. A five-year-old juvenile female passenger suffered serious injuries. She was taken by St. Clair Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. Stephanie L. Woods was subsequently arrested by the Highway Patrol on a charge of driving while intoxicated and endangering the welfare of a child. She was treated at Mercy Hospital in Washington and released. There was an accident at 1145 a.m. Saturday in Texas County on U.S. 63, seven miles north of Licking. A 2008 GMC Acadia operated by 63-year-old Janet M. Hagee of St. Louis traveling north on Highway 63 went off the right side of the roadway and struck a rock embankment. Janet M. Hagee, 63, of St. Louis, suffered uh, minor injuries, was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. A 15-year-old juvenile male passenger from Bourbon also suffered minor injuries and was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. They were both wearing their seatbelts. The Highway Patrol reported an arrest at 10.14 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County. 31-year-old Nicole A. Feldman of Washington arrested on a Franklin County warrant for driving while suspended. She was taken to the St. Louis County Jail and held without bond. 8.20 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County, 29-year-old Eric R. Hartsfield of Pacific picked up on a Pacific PD nuisance violation times five, a Lincoln County failure to appear for conservation violation. He was taken to the Franklin County Adult Detention Facility and was bondable. At 8.14 p.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 25-year-old Alvaro Delator of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma was picked up for DWI. Failure to drive on the right half of the roadway and failure to stop at a stop sign, he was processed and released. 2.54 a.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 40-year-old Jeremy D. Jackson of Steelville arrested for felony possession of a controlled substance, methamphetamine, misdemeanor possession, drug paraphernalia, failure to display valid plates on a motor vehicle and no taillights. He was taken to the Crawford County Jail and placed on 24-hour hold. 2.15 a.m. Sunday in Franklin County, Bradley R. Portner, 19, of Washington, arrested on a patrol charge of BWI. He was taken to the Washington Police Department, processed, and released. At 8.46 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County, 22-year-old Austin E. Davis of Ewing, Missouri, was arrested on a patrol charge for unlawful use of a weapon. He was taken to the St. Clair Police Department, processed, and released. 8.03 p.m. Saturday in Phelps County, 35-year-old Van T. Penton of Rolla arrested for felony DWI persistent offender, felony possession of controlled substance, oxycodone, and failure to have two operable headlamps. He was booked and released. At 5.54 p.m. on Saturday in Crawford County, 27-year-old Nicholas A. Harris of Springfield, Massachusetts was arrested for unlawful possession of controlled substance methamphetamine and unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia. He was booked and released. The Franklin County Highway Department has announced that Clemmy Road in the Gerald area would be closed beginning at 8 o'clock this morning through 3 p.m. on Tuesday for a cross-culvert replacement. The road will be closed at 3793 Clemmy Road and will be closed to all traffic, including emergency vehicles. Roller Road in the St. Clair area would be closed beginning at 8 a.m. on Wednesday through 3 p.m. on Friday for cross-culvert replacement. The closure will be two-tenths of a mile south of Highway AB with the nearest address of 1134 Roller Road. The road will be closed to all traffic, including emergency vehicles. If you have any questions, contact the Franklin County Highway Department at 636-583-6361. The Sullivan City Council is scheduled to have their regular meeting coming up on Tuesday at 7 o'clock in Sullivan City Hall. Under requests and petitions, the Sullivan School District will have a request for uh, some road closures for their homecoming parade on Wednesday, September 25th from 5.30 till 6.30 p.m. And the uh, Downtown Business Partnership asking for road closures for their third Saturday events from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. on April 20th, May 18th. June 15th, July 20th, September 21st, October 19th for flea markets and food booths. There'll be discussion of monthly bills totaling $1,822,756.65. Under ordinances, bill number 4020, sponsored by Alderman George Randy Counts, would approve an agreement with Axon body cameras for the police department through the 2023 Local Law Enforcement Block Grant Program with the Department of Public Safety. At a cost of $9,785.29, there will be no match required by the city. There is a closed session for real estate, litigation, personnel, and contractual negotiations in an open meeting at 7 o'clock on Tuesday at Sullivan City Hall. 
That's your look at local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. Do you have a guy? Like your dad or grandpa had a guy. Something broke around the house you couldn't fix, Gramps would say, call my guy. He probably drove an old blue pickup, big tool chest in the back, decades of calluses on strong hands, name on his shirt like Don or Ed or Buddy. He just always seemed to know the best way to fix any problem. That's why Grandpa trusted him. There's not many of those guys around today, and no wonder. Between taxes and technology, insurance and licensing, it's hard to be that guy and be competitive. Well, that's why this company started. We love what we do, and we still want to be that guy. Independent technicians, generations of combined experience, all joined together as one powerful team. Strength in numbers, you know. If you're ever stuck with a broken furnace or air conditioner, now you've got a guy. We're Level 9 Heating and Cooling. Level 9 HVAC.com. In recent funeral announcements, Renee Nicole Belor of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 44. Funeral services will be held at 11 o'clock this morning at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud with burial at the Emanuel Lutheran Cemetery in Rosebud. Visitation will be held from 9 a.m. till services at 11 at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud. All arrangements are under the direction of the Gotten Strader Funeral Home in Owensville. Wilbert Lee Franklin Adair of Cuba passed away Thursday, March 14th at the age of 88. Funeral services will be held at 1 o'clock this afternoon at the Myzel Funeral Home in Cuba. The interment will follow at Kinder Cemetery in Cuba. Visitation will be held from 11 a.m. until time of services at 1 o'clock today at the Myzel Funeral Home in Cuba. Wilma Elizabeth Scott, Nate Teeter of Sullivan, passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 80. She was the office manager here at KTUI Radio from 1966 to 2017. The services have been postponed at this time and will be rescheduled for a later date. Memorials to the Backpack Program and Grace United Methodist Church or BJC Hospice would be preferred. All arrangements are under the direction of the Eaton Funeral Home and Cremation Center of Sullivan. James H. Jim Monken of Steelville passed away on Thursday, March 14th at the age of 79. Funeral services will be held at 1 p.m. Tuesday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at St. James City Cemetery. Visitation will be held from 10 a.m. until services at 1 p.m. on Tuesday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. The service will be live streamed on Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 12.55 p.m. on Tuesday. Janice Lorraine Adams of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th in Owensville at the age of 82. A massive Christian burial will be held on Wednesday at 11 a.m. at the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church in Owensville with burial in the church cemetery. Visitation will be held from 9 to 11 a.m. on Wednesday at the God Street Funeral Home in Owensville. Memorials are requested for the family's choice. Barry Ray B.R. White of Steelville passed away at his home on Sunday, March 17th at the age of 70. Funeral services will be held at 11 a.m. Thursday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at Steelville Cemetery. The service will be live streamed on Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 10.55 a.m. Thursday. Visitation will be held from 6 until 8 p.m. on Wednesday evening at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. Memorials may be given to Golden Echoes in memory of Barry White. The completed funeral announcements with all the survivors will air during our expanded edition of KTUI News at 8 o'clock this morning. New Testament Baptist Church in Sullivan is starting a new addiction recovery ministry called Life Issues. It's a biblical approach to the 12 steps, bringing scriptural principles into personal focus and making them come alive for transformational living. Whether you struggle with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, or relationships, you'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through this program. Life Issues will meet weekly on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. at New Testament Baptist Church. You're not alone. To find out more, contact New Testament Baptist Church at 573-468-3334. Earn 5.51 annual percentage yield on a 7-month CD at Sullivan Bank. Use our CD calculator on SullivanBank.com and see how much you could earn. Experience great rates and a step up in service. We are waiting to greet you with a smile. Annual percentage yield of 5.51 APY is accurate as of December 26, 2023. $1,000 minimal balance required to earn stated APY. Penalty may be imposed for early withdrawal, which will reduce earnings on the account. Interest compounded and credited quarterly. Rates subject to change at any time. Available at all locations. 
Bobby D sitting in for Sam Scott here at the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. 29 minutes before the hour of 7 o'clock. Uh, right now, 27 degrees here at the studios of KTUI, uh, 25 at the Sullivan Regional Airport. Uh, we'll check out the weather and then get into sports. For the KTUI Weather Bug Weather Center, for this morning, we'll have a clear sky. It'll be Sunday day with a high of 42. A clear night tonight, low 24. Tuesday, sunny, high 68. Clear Tuesday night, the low 36. Wednesday is going to be a sunny day, high 62. Thursday, partly sunny, can't rule out a shower, the high 56. Friday, partly sunny with a stray shower, high 60. Sunshine, can't rule out a shower Saturday. For KTUI, I'm meteorologist Jim Rinaldi. Good Monday morning, everybody. Here's the latest in sports from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Cardinals picked up a big win in spring training action yesterday, led by a minor leaguer. Here's John Rooney and Mike Claiborne with the Cardinal recap. With Mike Claiborne, I'm John Rooney. Yesterday, the Cardinals were down by two runs in the eighth inning. It was Jose Fermin with a walk, and then a two-run homer by Luke and Baker tied it up. And then the Cardinals were able to take advantage of some walks, a hit by Michael Ciani, and then to the plate, young Brody Moore. Moore swings, and it's a high fly ball. Hamilton moving back. He's at the track. It's a grand slam for Moore. 10 to 6 Cardinals. Wow, what a finish, Claves. 10 to 6 Cardinals over Houston. It was a great finish, especially for Brody. One home run in 90 games, and uh, I think this will be the one he'll always remember. I think so. And JoJo Romero came after batters and put an end to the game, finishing up in the ninth inning, and Andre Pallante got the win. He was very aggressive, JoJo was, and that's something he's got to do in order to be part of this rotation as far as the bullpen's concerned. Our next broadcast comes your way tomorrow. It will be the Cardinals against the Marlins. Kyle Gibson will be on the mound at 11.55 a.m. Thank you very much, John. We'll have that Cardinals game on tomorrow on 102.1 KTUI-FM. Blues picked up a big win last night in back-to-back -back home games as they downed the Anaheim Ducks. Here's Alex Ferrario from the Blues Radio Network with a Blues recap. Last night, the Blues wrapped up a set of back-to-back -back games as their homestand continued against the Anaheim Ducks. In the first period, the Ducks would be the first team to score Troy Terry with a rebound right in front of the net. They would exit the first period with a 1-0 lead, but then Kevin Hayes would get the same rebound chance off of a Tory Krug shot to tie things up after two periods. Then the third period, the power play erupted. Three straight power play opportunities and three straight power play goals. Two by Robert Thomas, one by Jake Neighbors to take a 4-1 lead. Anaheim would score one late, but not enough to come back in this one. A 4-2 final score as the Blues pick up their 36th win of the season. Now sit four points behind Vegas for that bottom wild card spot, and they'll take on the Colorado Avalanche to wrap up the homestand on Tuesday. 7 o'clock puck drop, 6.30 pregame skate on the St. Louis Blues radio network. Thank you, Alex. We'll have that Blues game Tuesday night on 102.1 FM. College scoreboard from the weekend, Missouri State women's basketball put together an impressive defensive effort, beating Belmont Saturday evening 63-48 to get to the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament Championship on Sunday. But they saw their regular season come to an end with a layup at the buzzer by Drake's Anna Miller, spoiling a Lady Bear comeback as Drake won at 76-75. The Lady Bears, though, will take on the University of Illinois in the opening round of the inaugural Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament this Thursday in Champaign, Illinois. This marks the inaugural WBIT, which is an annual 32-team postseason invitation tournament for women's basketball that is owned and funded by the NCAA. College baseball, Missouri swept by number one Arkansas the weekend, losing 6-0 on Saturday, 9-1 on Sunday. Kansas State took a 12-6 come from behind victory over Missouri State on Saturday and finished off the sweep with an 11-3 victory over the Bears on Sunday. Four players homeward as number three Central Missouri won its 11th consecutive game on Saturday, cruising to a 16-4 seven-inning win over Washburn. Washburn came back on Sunday with a three-run homer in the bottom of the eighth to win the series finale 10-9. College of the Ozarks split a doubleheader with Mission University on Saturday, grabbing the first game 7-2, falling 5-3 in the second game. Trey Riley of St. James was 0-3 in each game for College of the Ozarks. Columbia College rolled to a doubleheader win over Harris Stowe on Saturday, taking down the Hornets 24-1 and 16-2. Chase McCaig from Herman was 0-2 with a run scored on Saturday. Cougars then finished off the sweep, taking Harris Stowe 19-2 on Sunday. McCaig went 0-1. 
ECC baseball swept a series with North Arkansas College over the weekend, winning 7-3 and 9-8 with a walk-off two-run homer on Saturday and then 14-11 on Sunday. Mason Snyder from Pacific pitched in relief in game one Saturday. Anthony Broker from St. Clair earned the win, going three and a third innings to pick up the win in the second game on Saturday. Emporia State fell to Rogers State 6-4 on Saturday afternoon. T.J. Rockerbomber from Herman won for four with a walk and a run scored for Emporia. The Hornets then outlasted Rogers State in a pitcher's duel one nothing Sunday afternoon to take the series two games to one. Rockerbomber was 0 for 2. Hannibal LaGrange fell twice at Missouri Baptist on Saturday, 9-3 and 21-6. Isaiah Helsher from Union was 2 for 5 with two walks and an RBI on the day for Hannibal LaGrange. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader for Mineral Area, 5-3 and 10-0 on Saturday. Sam Pauley from Washington, 0-4 for 4 with two walks and a run on the day for State Fair. Missouri S&T split a doubleheader with Drury on Saturday, taking the first game 11-5, losing the second game 14-2. Tommy Reether from Washington won for five with a walk on the day Saturday. Myers finished with a series split after winning 8-9-1 on Sunday. St. Louis Community College lost twice at home on Saturday to Crowder, 9-4 and 12-1. The Archers then went on the road to Crowder on Sunday, losing 10-0 and 11-4. Missouri-St. Louis swept Lewis University, 9-6 and 11-9 in a doubleheader on Saturday afternoon. Trent Anderson from Herman pitched the final two innings, giving up no runs on a hit and two strikeouts and two walks to earn his second save of the year in that second game. The Tritons won the series finale, 9-5 on Sunday. In softball, number 11 Missouri dropped their Saturday matinee against number 8 Tennessee 8-2. Tennessee pitching continued to dominate on Sunday as they finished off a sweep of Missouri in a 4-0 victory. Visiting Illinois State turned back Missouri State 7-2 on Saturday at Killian Stadium. Kayla Ulrich from Sullivan got the start at first base for the Lady Bears and went 3-4 for four with their first collegiate home run, a two-run shot in the bottom of the seventh. Missouri State then pounded out a season high 13 hits and got a six-inning home run from Manny Mueller to seal the deal in a 7-4 win over Illinois State on Sunday. Ulrich was 3-4 for four with an RBI in that game. Evangel Softball took both ends of a doubleheader with Bethany College on Saturday, 10-1 and 1-0. Naomi Perkins from Steelville, 1-5 for five with a run and an RBI on the day for Evangel. Fonbon Softball dropped both games in a doubleheader with Rose Holman, 6-5 in eight innings and 8-5 on Saturday. Madeline Holtmeyer from Washington, 0 for 2 in game one. They lost the home doubleheader with Dubuque on Sunday, 10-7 and 7-2. Jefferson College lost a pair of nail biters to St. Charles Community College on Saturday, falling 1-0 in nine innings and then losing 2-0 in the second game. On Sunday, the Vikings won a doubleheader for Metropolitan Community College in Kansas City by scores of 15-2 and 19-4. Sophia Wyrick from Sullivan, 0 for 2 in the first game with St. Charles Saturday, 0 for 4 in the first game against Metropolitan on Sunday. Kansas got a two-run single in the fourth inning and turned three double plays and a 2-0 win against number 13 Baylor on Saturday. Addison Purvis from Sullivan was 0 for 1 with a walk as DH for the Jayhawks. They finished off the sweep with a 1-0 victory on Sunday as Purvis drew another walk as a pinch hitter. Lindenwood softball dropping two close games at Tennessee State on Saturday, falling 2-1 and 5-4 in eight innings. Lions dropped their final game at Tennessee State 6-3 on Sunday. Hannah Johanning scored a run as a pinch runner in that game on Sunday. MSU West Plains split with three rivers on the road Saturday, losing 1-0 and pitching a 4-0 shutout in game two. They won both games with Lyon College on Sunday, 6-0 and 12-4. Alexis Funkhauser from Sullivan was 1-6 for six with two RBI against three rivers, 3-6 three for six with an RBI and a run versus Lyon. Rockers softball lost a home doubleheader to McHenry University, 4-3 in eight innings and then 7-1 on Saturday. Emma Vodnanski from Washington, 0-4 for four on the day for Rockhurst. They split a doubleheader with Umsel on Sunday, losing 8-5, winning 3-0. Vodnanski was 0-2. for two. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader at Metropolitan, 7-4 and 3-0 on Saturday. Myla Inman from Washington, 1-5 for five with a run and two RBI on the day. The Roadrunners then dropped a home doubleheader with Crowder on Sunday, 13-1 and 15-8. UHSP split with Westminster College on Saturday, 10-1 win in the first game, 4-2 loss in the second. Hannah Duggan from Pacific played right field in both games, was 0-2 at the plate in game two. University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy also split with Culver Stockton on Sunday, winning the first game 9-2, dropping the nightcap 8-0. 
Congratulations going out to Ryan Herman from St. Clair, who placed seventh at 285 pounds to close out the 2024 NCAA Division II Wrestling National Championships in Park City, Kansas over the weekend, wrestling for Maryville University. In outdoor track at the CMU Open on Saturday on the women's side, Madison Dixon from Herman running for William Woods was 12th in the 100-meter dash. Sailor Richardson from Owensville and William Woods was 14th. In the 200 meters, Richardson was 12th and Dixon was 19th. In the triple jump, Lauren Davis of Steelville and Evangel University was 5th. In the shot put, Kaylin Powers from Herman and Hannibal LaGrange was 2nd. Molly Pritchard from Pacific and State Fair Community College was 5th. Powers was 4th in the discus and Pritchard was 15th. Powers was 5th in the hammer throw. College schedule for today, East Central Softball will be at Culver Stockton to take on their JV in a doubleheader at 2 o'clock. In college golf, the UMSL men will be at the Oak Tree Invitational, William Woods Women in the State Fair Community College Invitational in Sedalia today. Congratulations going out to Herman High School senior Jill Rood on signing to play volleyball at Jefferson College in Hillsborough next year. Looking at the scoreboard from the local sports over the weekend, the Four Rivers Baseball Tournament Games at Union on Saturday. It was Solvin getting by Pacific 4-2 in a great game, and St. Clair lost to Union 15-0. At Owensville, St. James defeated New Haven 6-1, Owensville over Herman by a score of 5-1. At the Troy Classic, Washington losing twice, falling to Timberland 9-4 and Parkway West 8-1. Other games, Borgia defeated Wright City 11-3 in Varsity, 21-0 in JV. Cuba Baseball was in a round robin at Salem on Saturday. They fell to Salem 10-0 and lost to Vienna 11-8. At the Windsor JV Tournament, Valley beat Pacific 8-4, Windsor over Pacific 12-1. Girls Soccer at the Warrenton Soccer Classic, Washington defeated the host school 8-0. Sullivan over the St. Louis Patriots 2-0. Washington beat St. Clair 3-2, Sullivan over Ellsbury 3-2, and St. Clair beat St. Louis Christian, the Patriots, by a score of 3-0. At the Rolla Tournament on Saturday, it was Pacific over Rolla 5-2. Springfield Catholic beat Borgia 3-0. Pacific and Springfield Catholic played a 0-0 tie and Rolla over Borgia 3-2. Middle school volleyball at the Bland 8th grade tournament. Herman taking first place, beating Bland in two sets. Eugene was third as they downed Chamoy. At the St. James 8th grade tournament, Hawkins Junior High out of Jackson beat St. Clair in two sets for the championship. Salem over St. James in two sets for third place. Looking at the local schedule for today, high school baseball, Bell and Bourbon are playing in the Stoutland Tournament this week. Bell opens up today at 5 o'clock against Lakeway at Tiger Field. Bourbon will not play until Tuesday. They'll take on Dixon at 4 o'clock on Tuesday and then Stoutland at 6 o'clock in the pool play part of that tournament. The Four Rivers Conference Tournament will wrap up on Wednesday. Games to be played at Solvin at 4 o'clock. It'll be St. James and Owensville for consolation. Solvin and Union for the championship at 6. Games at St. Clair on Wednesday. New Haven and Herman at 4 o'clock for 7th place. Pacific and St. Clair for 3rd place. Washington is uh, in pool play today at the Troy Classic. They'll take on Hannibal at 4.30 today at Troy. At the Windsor JV Baseball Tournament today, DeSoto takes on Pacific at 6 o'clock. Girls soccer coming up today. Solvin begins play in the Lutheran St. Charles Tournament as they will take on University City at 6.15. They'll have a game on Tuesday against Northwest and Thursday against Lutheran St. Charles. Other games today, Owensville at Pacific, varsity only at 5. St. James at Eugene, varsity only at 5. Union at St. Clair, varsity then JV at 5 o'clock this evening. High school track today, Solvent hosting an early season quad meet with Bourbon, St. Clair, and Union. That'll get underway at 3 o'clock with the field events, running events at 4. Middle school track today, Bland will be at Lynn, and that meet starts at 3.30. High school golf today, Bell and Owensville order a match at Cuba Lakes Classic at 4 o'clock. Borge and Union in the Father Tolton Invitational Tournament at 10 this morning. Potosi at St. James for a dual meet at 4 this afternoon. Middle school volleyball coming up tonight. Bland will be at New Haven at 5.30. Eugene at Owensville at 5 o'clock. That's your look at sports on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. 
Come join us at our Seidenstruger Nobi Partners Spring Open House April 5th and 6th at our Union dealership and get in the yellow seat. We have event-only specials and you can save big on our John Deere compact tractors. Take advantage of 0% financing for 84 months with zero down. Plus, save up to an additional $2,500 on model year 23 compact tractors. Visit SNPartners.com for more information. Offer valid through 4-6-2024. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. A huge decision that must be made every spring is when to start grazing livestock on pasture. Hi, I'm Jody Hinky. Take extra care of that decision if you just seeded it, as you're living the country life. Living the country life. Ideas and inspiration for your place in the country. You can find more information on today's topic and from previous shows by visiting us online at livingthecountrylife.com. We'll return to the show after these messages. Whenever you're online, Living the Country Life is there too. Like us on Facebook and exchange tips and ideas with people who share your love for the country way of life. Follow us on Twitter at Small Farming for timely news and information. You can also find us on Instagram and Pinterest. See the latest inspired shot from our readers or add a garden tip to your boards. Living the Country Life has all the ideas for your home acreage. Visit us online at livingthecountrylife.com and find us on social media. If you're looking for new ideas for what to do around your place in the country, register for the Living the Country Life newsletter. Once a week, you'll receive helpful tips in your inbox on a wide variety of seasonal and timely topics, along with so much more. Living the Country Life is for all those people who love to live in the country. Sign up for your free newsletter today by visiting livingthecountrylife.com. Spring is at our fingertips and everything's starting to green up. Feed is the number one cost of raising livestock, so producers are antsy to get their animals on pasture. Gary Lacefield is a retired extension forage specialist at the University of Kentucky. He says spring is the perfect time for pasture improvement. This includes soil fertility, the right species, and the proper seed planting. And establish it so there's an optimum range of dates that we want to see for your area and your farm. Also, depth is extremely important. One of the biggest mistakes that I see on farms is taking these little forage seeds and seeding them too deep. So shallow, usually about a quarter inch, good seed to soil contact. Most of the forage seed is going to have to absorb a lot of water before it can germinate. Once it comes up, make sure the forage is ready to be munched on before turning out the animals. Oftentimes we can go to all the expense for buying the seed, seeding it, using the right fertility. Then we get a stand and we say, that is so good, let's turn some cattle in there and graze it. And we graze it too quick. And a grass, for example, has to develop some root system to anchor itself in the soil. So if we try to graze it too quick, we could really do damage to the stand. And likewise, if we try to cut it too quick for hay or haylage, we could do damage on that establishment phase. Depending on the species, there should be six to eight inches of plant growth before putting animals out there. You can test its readiness with a simple cow tongue test. Just as the cow wraps her tongue around the plants and pulls them to her mouth, grab a handful of plants. If they pull out by the roots rather than breaking off above the ground, the pasture is not ready for grazing. Learn more about spring pastures at livingthecountrylife.com. I'll see you in the country. Living the Country Life. Ideas and inspiration for your place in the country. You can find more information on today's topic, share your tips, and post photos by visiting us online at Living the Country Life. Across our wide Missouri with Bob Pretty. Listen to show archives, hear about this day in Missouri history, and learn more about the Show Me State by visiting MissouriNet.com today. Sam Flowers, who lived near Redford, a small town in southeast Missouri's Reynolds County, was on his way home from Ellington that fateful afternoon. Perhaps he was hurrying to beat the storm that was forming around him. We'll never know. For that storm beginning to churn in the southeast Missouri Ozarks reached down and killed him. His body was found the next day three miles north of Ellington. Sam Flowers was the first victim of the worst tornado in American history, a storm that ironically does not rank among the ten worst in Missouri history. The story in a minute. I spy something yellow. Is it a car? No. Is it a building? Nope. What is it? It's that yellow post over there. What is that? 
Well, that's a pipeline marker used to show the general location of a pipeline and provides emergency contact information on it. This message is from Mango, Missouri's Association of Natural Gas Operators, letting you know to keep an eye out for pipeline markers. Feeling overwhelmed? Call, text, or chat 988. If you or someone you care about is struggling with thoughts of suicide, facing a mental health or substance use crisis, or if you simply need someone to listen, call, text, or chat 988. It's your direct connection to free, confidential, and compassionate support. Call, text, or chat 988 to connect with trained crisis specialists, day or night. A message from the Missouri Department of Mental Health. It's about 1 o'clock that afternoon when Sam Flowers died. Fifteen minutes later, the storm roared into Annapolis, the mining town of Lidana, two miles to the south. The tornado at times cutting a path 300 feet wide demolished Annapolis, leaving only a half dozen buildings standing. About 400 were destroyed or so badly damaged they were uninhabitable. Later that afternoon, when the first relief trains reached Annapolis, people moved into boxcars for shelter. The first reports from southeast Missouri said that two were dead at Annapolis, six at Perryville, another person dead at Wittenberg, and one more at Altenburg, and that ten had been reported killed at Beale, a small village north of Cape Girardeau, where the tornado was reported to have split into two funnels for three and a half miles. After sweeping across Madison, Bollinger, and Cape Girardeau counties, the tornado hopped the Mississippi River about 25 miles north of Cape Girardeau and roared through southern Illinois with winds twisting at 180 miles an hour. It swept across the flatlands at a mile in a minute, and in seconds it destroyed the entire town of Gorham, killing or hurting more than 40 percent of the residents. Eight minutes later, it wiped out 40 percent of Murfreesboro, where it took its heaviest toll of all, 234 dead. Just four minutes after that, it destroyed 30 percent of the buildings in DeSoto, Illinois, where 69 more people died. Next in line, West Frankfurt, where another 148 people were killed and 410 more were injured. It destroyed 90 percent of the small town of Parrish, where almost one-third of the people were killed or hurt. The tiny town of Griffin, Indiana, disappeared into the storm. Just east of Griffin, the terrible storm began to veer slightly to the north and spun off two more funnel clouds. And for six miles in rural southeast Indiana, there were three funnels. They destroyed 85 farms before they roared into Owensville, Indiana, and destroyed a fourth of the town. The storm ripped into Princeton, Indiana, more than 70 miles an hour, making that town its last victim before finally dissipating. The final totals, 13 dead in Missouri. In Indiana, there were 76 dead. In Illinois, 606 people had been killed. 695 fatalities in this storm. That is almost twice as many people killed as killed in any other tornado or series of tornadoes on one day in American history. More than 2,000 people were injured that day. More than 1,500 of them lived in Illinois, the rest in Missouri and Indiana. The tri-state tornado, they call it. The Weather Bureau teams of investigators who went to the scene were heavily criticized for lack of warning of the storm's path. But forecasting severe storms was more inexact then. Not until 1942 did the Weather Bureau implement a tornado warning system. Judith Joy, noting more than a half century after this worst of storms, many people in the region, she said, upon seeing a line of thunderstorms approaching on a warm spring day, noting the sky turning that strange kind of greenish-yellow color that sometimes comes with bad weather, she said many of those people would start to nervously scan the horizon, especially those who remember their grandparents' stories. They would look to the southwest, the same horizon where the worst tornado in American history roared out of Missouri on this date, March 18th in 1925. That was Across Our Wide Missouri with Bob Pretty. To listen to show archives, hear about this day in Missouri history, and learn more about the Show Me State, visit MissouriNet.com. While individuals compete in track and field events, there is often a team component to the standings, with points awarded for each team member for the events in which they place. Now imagine a national collegiate finals in which a one-person team won the championship. That's just how amazing this athlete was. The story is this edition of the American Countryside. I'm Tyne Morgan, host of U.S. Farm Report, the only weekend television show that features some of agriculture's biggest names. From custom commentary from John Phipps to the stories of antique iron with Machinery Pete to a list of more than 30 marketing analysts, our weekly program focuses on the topics that matter most to you. We invite you to join us each weekend for U.S. Farm Report, timely, trusted tradition.
Hi, I'm Ag Day host Clinton Griffiths, and I invite you to join me each morning as we cover the nation's food system, from fields of green to orchards of orange and livestock everywhere in between. America runs on agriculture, and here at Ag Day, agriculture is what we do best. Listen as our analysts track the markets, learn about innovations in technology and sustainability, and live the country lifestyle through the eyes of rural America. Join me, Clinton Griffiths, for Ag Day, the country experience. In 1932, Babe Diedrichsen won the AAU National Track and Field Championships as a one-woman team, an accomplishment that led her to compete in the 1932 Olympic Games. She ended up competing in the javelin throw, the hurdles, and high jump. In those, she got gold in the javelin, and she set the world record. Sadie Atha shares the story from the Babe Diedrichsen Museum in Beaumont, Texas. Babe also won gold in the 80-meter hurdles and silver in the high jump when the judges broke a tie on technique. Those medals are on display here at the museum. But Babe was talented in many sports and soon began focusing on the game of golf, where she perhaps made her biggest impact. She won 82 tournaments in her whole lifetime and even consecutively had 17 winning titles and was the first American to win one of the British tournaments. She really made a name for herself, and that really goes into why she's the world's greatest female athlete. She was a founding member of the LPGA, opening the doors for more women to compete in the game of golf. And it was the game of golf that led her to marriage. She married George Saharis and he was a pro wrestler and they met accidentally because they were paired together for a golf tournament with a minister and the minister actually won because they were so enamored with each other. They were married in 1938. In 1953, at the age of 42, Babe Diedrichsen was diagnosed with cancer. She died three years later. Her life was but 45 years, but her accomplishments across so many sports earned her the title of Female Athlete of the Century by the Associated Press. Although decades have passed, her story remains an inspiration. Her accomplishments across so many sports, perhaps to never be equaled. Traveling the countryside in Beaumont, Texas, I'm Andrew McRae. What makes a world champion cheese? Hello, I'm Megan Grebner with Healthy Living on Brownfield. The World Championship Cheese Contest is hosted every two years by the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. With more than 3,300 entries this year, it's deemed the Olympics of cheese. Tim Omer with Emmy Roth Cheese, a prior winner, shares what makes cheese a champion. First of all, make a quality product. I mean, that's really at the end of the day, when you're talking about the dairy farmer, I think that's a competitive advantage that we have in the Midwest is that we have my opinion, is the best milk globally. I think if you can focus on quality, you have a quality product, and that starts obviously with the milk, and really focus on doing the best you possibly can, being the best cheesemaker you can, you're going to be successful. And if you can, um, my, my advice would be to win. He says their competition victory has significantly impacted their business. Since we won the competition, we actually purchased another cheese plant in uh, near the Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we have manufacturing in Platteville, Wisconsin, Monroe, Wisconsin, and then also Seymour, Wisconsin. So we bought another cheese plant. All of our cheese plants, we have three in the state of Wisconsin, all are filled up. And um, we're actually just built a conversion facility in Stoughton, Wisconsin. And like I mentioned previously, our business since we won the competition has more than doubled. I'm Megan Grabner with Healthy Living on Brownfield. It's time now for the Focus on the Family Family Minute. Here's the thing, grave clothes are tight. Most of the time we need a little help shimmying out of them. Robin Dykstra on Focus on the Family Minute. Verse 44 says, Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus needed help to get out of his grave clothes to get his good stuff back. There's no shame in asking for help. You know who makes you feel bad about asking for help? The enemy of your soul. Don't be a burden. Don't be a pain. You, you just suck it up, buttercup, and get on with things. Send him packing and ask for help. And maybe you need a helping hand or a little medicine or a little therapy or a little prayer support or a little coaching or a little mentoring or somebody who will bang on the gates of heaven for you in prayer on a regular basis. But ask for it because we are not mind readers. More from Robin at FamilyMinute.org. We are KTUI 1560 AM Sullivan, Missouri, broadcasting live from the Sullivan Bank Studios. It is 7 o'clock time now for you. 
USA News. I'm Ryan Daniels. The man accused of killing three family members in Pennsylvania this weekend is being formally charged now. Authorities say Andre Gordon killed his stepmother and teenage sister with an AR-15 style assault rifle Saturday morning, then killed the mother of his two children at another home. He fled to New Jersey in a stolen vehicle where he barricaded himself inside a house and was eventually arrested. He now faces charges in both states, including first and second degree murder in Pennsylvania. Marriage rates in the U.S. are back to pre-pandemic levels. USA's Dave Collins. New government data shows there were just over 2 million marriages in the U.S. in 2022, roughly 6.2 marriages per 1,000 people. That's the highest level since 2018. While numbers seem to have recovered from the pandemic, the last two decades have seen an overall downward trend in marriage rates. I'm Dave Collins. One former top U.S. politician says she's worried former President Trump might hand key intel over to U.S. adversaries like Russia once he begins receiving classified materials as the presumptive Republican nominee. Hopefully those advising him would say, grow up, live up to your responsibilities. Don't share this with the Russian foreign minister, as he did in the Oval Office. Former Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on with CNN's State of the Union Sunday. The White House nowhere near in agreement with the idea that it's time for Israel to bring new elections. At least that's what National Security Council spokesman John Kirby told Fox News Sunday this weekend. Uh, He is the Prime Minister of Israel. We respect the sovereignty of the Israeli people. Kirby referring to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu following Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's speech calling for new elections in Israel last week. This is USA News. Every day, our brave military men and women, along with their families, make tremendous sacrifices for our freedom. Patriotic Hearts, a nonprofit organization, is dedicated to supporting these heroes and their families in their times of need. By donating your unwanted car to Patriotic Hearts, you'll be supporting job transition and job fair programs, veteran entrepreneurship, counseling, and retreats for combat veterans and their spouses. Call 800-804-7211. You'll receive a tax deduction and we'll arrange a free pickup at your convenience. Imagine the difference you can make in the lives of those who have given so much for our country. Your car donation will directly impact military families, veterans, providing them with the support they desperately need. Call 800-804-7211. You can become a part of something bigger. Join us in our mission to uplift and honor our military community. Call 800-804-7211 to donate your unwanted car to Patriotic Hearts. Former President Trump says he warned Russian President Vladimir Putin not to invade Ukraine. He made that comment while speaking with Fox News over the weekend, also claiming Russia never would have invaded had he been re-elected president in 2020. I would have negotiated a deal. I don't even know if I would have had to negotiate. They never would have attacked while I was president. Ukraine's running out of ammunition and resources in the battle as U.S. aid has hit a roadblock in Congress. Meanwhile, the world learned of Putin's recent re-election to the top office in Russia, meaning the conflict with Ukraine will continue. Now everyone is happy when they are the subject of a Netflix documentary, USA's John Schaefer explains. A father and son are suing Netflix for significant damages due to their portrayal in a documentary about the nationwide college admission scandal. John Wilson Sr. and Jr. filed the lawsuit last week claiming that Netflix unfairly associated them with others convicted of conspiracy and fraud for college admissions. While John Wilson Sr. had his conviction overturned on appeal, he argues that the 2021 film has still tarnished the reputations despite his innocence being proven. Current leaders at the West Point Military Academy believe duty, honor, country is more of a motto than a mission statement, so they are making a change. From now on, the West Point mission statement will read simply Army Values. It's a noted effort toward more inclusivity. I'm Ryan Daniels, USA News. Do you have a story to tell? Bring your story to life with audiobooks. Great stories deserve great storytelling. Audiobook Network provides professional voice actors and full production services for every author's manuscript. From narration, production, and editing to distribution, promotion, and sales, Audiobook Network handles everything. If you have a print book, ebook, or even a manuscript, call Audiobook Network now and get our free audiobook guide. 800 734 1229. 800 734 1229. 
You deserve extraordinary care close to home. From primary care to advanced specialties right here in Sullivan and access to all that BJC Healthcare has to offer. We're here to provide the care you need. Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital and BJC Healthcare. Care that is comprehensive, coordinated, and completely about you. Learn more at MissouriBaptistSullivan.org. Missouri Net News, I'm Marshall Griffin. The Missouri House has passed a bill that looks to amend the state constitution by making the Jackson County Assessor an elected position. If the bill from Blue Springs Republican Dan Stacy passes the General Assembly, it'll go to voters on a statewide ballot. Jackson County is the only Tartar County in Missouri that has an appointed assessor position rather than an elected one. The county's assessments have been the subject of frustration for months as property values have gone up by nearly 40 percent since 2021. Aside from receiving criticism from the state auditor, it's also the subject of a lawsuit filed by the Attorney General. The legislation heads to the Senate for consideration. Some of the preliminary work to expand I-70 to six lanes across Missouri will begin tonight, weather pending. Work crews will begin drilling core samples of older pavement and geology underneath the east and westbound lanes of I-70 between Columbia and Kingdom City. MoDOT Director Patrick McKenna says planning and preparations are moving quickly. To move to the point where we've got permitting, where we've got um, a process in place, enough on the engineering, enough um, information to move an interstate project. This is only six months from when the um, when last year's budget bill was signed into law. Meanwhile, core drilling work is scheduled for 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Monday through Friday for the next six weeks. Site selection is underway in Missouri for a new natural gas plant for the state's electric cooperatives. To meet growing demand, the co-ops are building a new plant at Ripley Energy Center in Oklahoma and another inside Missouri. Caleb Jones is CEO of the state's electric cooperatives. Technology has changed with agriculture and also the ability to have electricity is, has really caused a lot of, of growth in rural areas. People now having the same resources available they would have in town but want a better way of life or moving out to rural areas. So we've certainly seen an increase not just in population but also energy load too. Electric cooperatives maintain 130,000 miles of power lines in rural Missouri to their member owners. This is Missouri Net. In search of the perfect cut for your lawn? Join the pursuit by choosing from a full line of steel mowers. From gas and battery options to zero turns and push mowers, steel offers a wide range of mowing solutions for homeowners and professionals. Right now, get 0% financing on your purchase with a steel zero turn mower. Real steel. Find yours at steelusa.com slash mowers. Available at select dealers. Financing available on qualifying purchases and subject to credit approval. See dealer for details. Hi, I'm E.J. Williams. Each year, millions of animals are abandoned and more than a million are euthanized before they can be rescued. Organizations like American Humane are working to harness the healing power of the human-animal bond as animals can be trained as life-saving service and therapy dogs to help veterans, the elderly, and children with special needs to overcome the obstacles of everyday life. To find out how you can help give animals and the people they help a new leash on life, please visit AmericanHumane.org. Missouri's governor provides an update on the southern border. Anthony Moore with reports. Governor Mike Parson has deployed personnel to the U.S.-Mexico border in Texas. Eleven state patrol troopers have been supporting the Texas Department of Public Safety since March 1st. 48 Missouri National Guard members began their work on Friday after receiving initial orders last Monday. The deployment is part of Operation Lone Star, which is designed to curb illegal border crossings, the smuggling of drugs, and homeland security. The Missouri National Guard members and troopers will help with the construction of physical barriers, security patrols, traffic enforcement, and crime prevention. Parson issued an executive order last month activating up to 200 National Guard members and 22 patrol troopers for Texas Governor Greg Abbott's mission. The National Weather Service has confirmed a weak AF0 tornado swept through Charlac and St. Louis County Thursday. Damage was confined to trees, fencing, roof, and siding. And a magnitude 3.5 earthquake shook the Kansas City area Friday afternoon. There's no word of any damage. This is Missouri Net. Grab a hold of this opportunity and say big with Seidenstrigger Nopi Partners. We're blowing out last year's John Deere compact tractor models with deep discounts plus 0% financing options. Seidenstrigger Nopi Partners wants to be part of your property with a new John Deere compact tractor package. It's your time to make a big impact with compacts. Hurry, these deals won't last. Seidenstrigger Nobi, your partner for the land. Offer valid through 229-2024. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. 
Looking at our local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank studios of KTUI Radio. A fatality accident occurred in Washington County at 10.13 p.m. Saturday on Route E near Wicket Road. A 2004 Honda CT750 motorcycle operated by 30-year-old Adam J. Sapp of Irondale traveling west on Route E went out of control off the right side of the roadway, struck a mailbox and overturned. Adam J. Sapp, 30, of Irondale, was pronounced dead at the scene. A passenger, 55-year-old Bonnie J. Sapp of Cadet, Missouri, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Washington County Memorial Hospital by Washington County Ambulance District. The Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.40 p.m. on Sunday in Crawford County near No. 10 Grand Oaks. A 2023 Yamaha motorcycle operated by a 13-year-old juvenile from Salvin traveled off the right side of the roadway and struck several trees ejecting the driver. The 13-year-old male juvenile from Salvin suffered serious injuries and was flown to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. At 7.20 p.m. Saturday in Dent County at 119 Highway DD, a go-kart operated by a 7-year-old male juvenile from Rolla made an abrupt turn causing the passenger to be ejected. The passenger, 31-year-old Andrea M. Bowers of Rolla, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Phelps Health for treatment. Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.50 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on northbound Route in near Finney Lake Drive. A 2003 Honda Accord driven by a 16-year-old female juvenile from Villa Ridge was traveling north on Route End too fast for the Kirby Road. Crossed the center line of the roadway, overcorrected to the right. The vehicle began rotating clockwise, went off the right side of the roadway and overturned several times. The 16-year-old female juvenile driver from Villa Ridge suffered moderate injuries, was taken by Merrimack Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in Washington. A 16-year-old female juvenile passenger suffered serious injuries and was taken by Merrimack Ambulance District to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. There was an accident at 4.08 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on Old Highway K west of Little Indian Creek Road. A 2004 Ford F-150 pickup operated by Stephanie L. Woods, 38 of Lundell, Traveling eastbound on Old Highway K, driver failed to maintain control of the vehicle, went off the left side of the highway. Stephanie Woods suffered serious injuries, was taken to Mercy Hospital in Washington by St. Clair Ambulance. She was not wearing her seatbelt. A five-year-old juvenile female passenger suffered serious injuries. She was taken by St. Clair Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. Stephanie L. Woods was subsequently arrested by the Highway Patrol on a charge of driving while intoxicated and endangering the welfare of a child. She was treated at Mercy Hospital in Washington and released. There was an accident at 11.45 a.m. Saturday in Texas County on U.S. 63, seven miles north of Licking. A 2008 GMC Acadia operated by 63-year-old Janet M. Hagee of St. Louis traveling north on Highway 63 went off the right side of the roadway and struck a rock embankment. Janet M. Hagee, 63, of St. Louis, suffered minor injuries, was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. A 15-year-old juvenile male passenger from Bourbon also suffered minor injuries and was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. They were both wearing their seatbelts. The Highway Patrol reported an arrest at 10.14 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County. 31-year-old Nicole A. Feldman of Washington arrested on a Franklin County warrant for driving while suspended. She was taken to the St. Louis County Jail and held without bond. 8.20 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County, 29-year-old Eric R. Hartsfield of Pacific picked up on a Pacific PD nuisance violation times five, a Lincoln County failure to appear for conservation violation. He was taken to the Franklin County Adult Detention Facility and was bondable. At 8.14 p.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 25-year-old Alvaro Delator of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma was picked up for DWI. Failure to drive on the right half of the roadway and failure to stop at a stop sign, he was processed and released. 2.54 a.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 40-year-old Jeremy D. Jackson of Steelville arrested for felony possession of a controlled substance, methamphetamine, misdemeanor possession, drug paraphernalia, failure to display valid plates on a motor vehicle and no taillights. He was taken to the Crawford County Jail and placed on 24-hour hold. 2.15 a.m. Sunday in Franklin County, Bradley R. Portner, 19, of Washington, arrested on a patrol charge of BWI. He was taken to the Washington Police Department, processed, and released. At 8.46 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County, 22-year-old Austin E. Davis of Ewing, Missouri, was arrested on a patrol charge for unlawful use of a weapon. He was taken to the St. Clair Police Department, processed, and released. 
8.03 p.m. Saturday in Phelps County, 35-year-old Van T. Penton of Rolla arrested for felony DWI persistent offender, felony possession of controlled substance, oxycodone, and failure to have two operable headlamps. He was booked and released. At 5.54 p.m. on Saturday in Crawford County, 27-year-old Nicholas A. Harris of Springfield, Massachusetts, was arrested for unlawful possession of controlled substance methamphetamine and unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia. He was booked and released. The Franklin County Highway Department has announced that Clemmy Road in the Gerald area would be closed beginning at 8 o'clock this morning through 3 p.m. on Tuesday for a cross-culvert replacement. The road will be closed at 3793 Clemmy Road and will be closed to all traffic, including emergency vehicles. Roller Road in the St. Clair area would be closed beginning at 8 a.m. on Wednesday through 3 p.m. on Friday for cross-culvert replacement. The closure will be two-tenths of a mile south of Highway AB with the nearest address of 1134 Roller Road. The road will be closed to all traffic, including emergency vehicles. If you have any questions, contact the Franklin County Highway Department at 636 583 6 The Sullivan City Council is scheduled to have their regular meeting coming up on Tuesday at 7 o'clock at Sullivan City Hall. Under requests and petitions, the Sullivan School District will have a request for uh, some road closures for their homecoming parade on Wednesday, September 25th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And the uh, Downtown Business Partnership asking for road closures for their third Saturday events from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. on April 20th, May 18th. June 15th, July 20th, September 21st, October 19th for flea markets and food booths. There will be discussion of monthly bills totaling $1,822,756.65. Under ordinances, bill number 4020, sponsored by Alderman George Randy Counts, would approve an agreement with Axon body cameras for the police department through the 2023 Local Law Enforcement Block Grant Program with the Department of Public Safety. At a cost of $9,785.29, there will be no match required by the city. There is a closed session for real estate, litigation, personnel, and contractual negotiations in an open meeting at 7 o'clock on Tuesday at Sullivan City Hall. That's your look at local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. Come join us at our Seidenstruger Nobi Partners Spring Open House April 5th and 6th at our Union dealership and get in the yellow seat. We have event-only specials and you can save big on our John Deere compact tractors. Take advantage of 0% financing for 84 months with zero down. Plus save up to an additional $2,500 on model year 23 compact tractors. Visit SNPartners.com for more information. Offer valid through 4-6-2024. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. New Testament Baptist Church in Sullivan is starting a new addiction recovery ministry called Life Issues. It's a biblical approach to the 12 steps, bringing scriptural principles into personal focus and making them come alive for transformational living. Whether you struggle with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, or relationships, you'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through this program. Life Issues will meet weekly on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. at New Testament Baptist Church. You're not alone. To find out more, contact New Testament Baptist Church at 573-468-3334. In recent funeral announcements, Renee Nicole Bellore of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 44. Funeral services will be held at 11 o'clock this morning at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud with burial at the Emanuel Lutheran Cemetery in Rosebud. Visitation will be held from 9 a.m. till services at 11 at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud. All arrangements are under the direction of the Gotten Strader Funeral Home in Owensville. Wilbert Lee Franklin Adair of Cuba passed away Thursday, March 14th at the age of 88. Funeral services will be held at 1 o'clock this afternoon at the Myzel Funeral Home in Cuba. The interment will follow at Kinder Cemetery in Cuba. Visitation will be held from 11 a.m. until time of services at 1 o'clock today at the Myzel Funeral Home in Cuba. Wilma Elizabeth Scott, Nate Teeter of Sullivan, passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 80. She was the office manager here at KTUI Radio from 1966 to 2017. The services have been postponed at this time and will be rescheduled for a later date. Memorials to the Backpack Program and Grace United Methodist Church or BJC Hospice would be preferred. All arrangements are under the direction of the Eaton Funeral Home and Cremation Center of Sullivan. James H. Jim Monken of Steelville passed away on Thursday, March 14th at the age of 79. Funeral services will be held at 1 p.m. Tuesday 
at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at St. James City Cemetery. Visitation will be held from 10 a.m. until services at 1 p.m. on Tuesday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. The service will be live streamed on Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 12.55 p.m. on Tuesday. Janice Lorraine Adams of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th in Owensville at the age of 82. A massive Christian burial will be held on Wednesday at 11 a.m. at the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church in Owensville with burial in the church cemetery. Visitation will be held from 9 to 11 a.m. on Wednesday at the God's Street Funeral Home in Owensville. Memorials are requested for the family's choice. Barry Ray B.R. White of Steelville passed away at his home on Sunday, March 17th at the age of 70. Funeral services will be held at 11 a.m. Thursday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at Steelville Cemetery. The service will be live streamed on Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 10.55 a.m. Thursday. Visitation will be held from 6 until 8 p.m. on Wednesday evening at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. Memorials may be given to Golden Echoes in memory of Barry White. The completed funeral announcements with all the survivors will air during our expanded edition of KTUI News at 8 o'clock this morning. Your 401k is likely one of your most important assets, but it's only one part of a comprehensive retirement strategy. Edward Jones can help you understand how your retirement assets fit into your entire retirement picture so you can work toward meeting your unique retirement goals. Contact me, Donnie Greenwald, your Sullivan Edward Jones Financial Advisor at number 10 First Community Plaza in Sullivan. Edward Jones, member SIPC. We all want to be the best version of ourselves, and Compass Health Network is your preferred provider for all things related to your health and well-being. From primary care and mental health services to pediatric and adult dental procedures, our professional and compassionate staff is here for you. Call us today at 844-853-8937 or visit compasshealthnetwork.org to find a location in your area. Compass Health Network is here to help you reach your health care goals. We have uh, 23, uh, 22 minutes past the hour of uh, 7 o'clock here on this Monday morning. Bobby D. with you, uh, sitting in for Sam Scott. 27 degrees at the studios here at the Sullivan Bank Studios at KTUI Radio. Uh, currently 24 out at the Sullivan Regional Airport. Uh, the complete weather forecast and get into sports. For the KTUI Weather Bug Weather Center, for this morning we'll have a clear sky. It'll be Sunday today with a high of 42. A clear night tonight, low 24. Tuesday, sunny, high 68. Clear Tuesday night, the low 36. Wednesday is going to be a sunny day, high 62. Thursday, partly sunny, can't rule out a shower, the high 56. Friday, partly sunny with a stray shower, high 60. Sunshine, can't rule out a shower Saturday. For KTUI, I'm meteorologist Jim Rinaldi. Earn 5.51 annual percentage yield on a seven-month CD at Sullivan Bank. Use our CD calculator on SullivanBank.com and see how much you could earn. Experience great rates and a step up in service. We are waiting to greet you with a smile. Annual percentage yield of 5.51 APY is accurate as of December 26, 2023. $1,000 minimal balance required to earn stated APY. Penalty may be imposed for early withdrawal, which will reduce earnings on the account. Interest compounded and credited quarterly. Rate subject to change at any time. Available at all locations. Good Monday morning, everybody. Here's the latest in sports from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Cardinals picked up a big win in spring training action yesterday, led by a minor leaguer. Here's John Rooney and Mike Claiborne with the Cardinal recap. With Mike Claiborne, I'm John Rooney. Yesterday, the Cardinals were down by two runs in the eighth inning. It was Jose Fermin with a walk, and then a two-run homer by Luke and Baker tied it up. And then the Cardinals were able to take advantage of some walks, a hit by Michael Ciani, and then to the plate, young Brody Moore. Moore swings, and it's a high fly ball. Hamilton moving back. He's at the track. It's a grand slam for Moore. 10 to 6 Cardinals. Wow, what a finish, Claves. 10 to 6 Cardinals over Houston. It was a great finish, especially for Brody. One home run in 90 games, and uh, I think this will be the one he'll always remember. I think so, and JoJo Romero came after batters and put an end to the game, finishing up in the ninth inning, and Andre Pallante got the win. He was very aggressive, JoJo was, and that's something he's got to do in order to be part of this rotation as far as the bullpen's concerned. Our next broadcast comes your way tomorrow. It will be the Cardinals against the Marlins. Kyle Gibson will be on the mound at 11.55 a.m. 
Thank you very much, John. We'll have that Cardinals game on tomorrow on 102.1 KTUI-FM. Blues picked up a big win last night in back-to-back home games as they downed the Anaheim Ducks. Here's Alex Ferrario from the Blues Radio Network with a Blues recap. Last night, the Blues wrapped up a set of back-to-back games as their homestand continued against the Anaheim Ducks. In the first period, the Ducks would be the first team to score Troy Terry with a rebound right in front of the net. They would exit the first period with a 1-0 lead, but then Kevin Hayes would get the same rebound chance off of a Tory Krug shot to tie things up after two periods. Then the third period, the power play erupted. Three straight power play opportunities and three straight power play goals. Two by Robert Thomas, one by Jake Neighbors to take a 4-1 lead. Anaheim would score one late, but not enough to come back in this one. A 4-2 final score as the Blues pick up their 36th win of the season. Now sit four points behind Vegas for that bottom wild card spot, and they'll take on the Colorado Avalanche to wrap up the homestand on Tuesday. 7 o'clock puck drop, 6.30 pregame skate on the St. Louis Blues radio network. Thank you, Alex. We'll have that Blues game Tuesday night on 102.1 FM. College scoreboard from the weekend, Missouri State women's basketball put together an impressive defensive effort, beating Belmont Saturday evening 63-48 to get to the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament Championship on Sunday. But they saw their regular season come to an end with a layup at the buzzer by Drake's Anna Miller, spoiling a Lady Bear comeback as Drake won at 76-75. The Lady Bears, though, will take on the University of Illinois in the opening round of the inaugural Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament this Thursday in Champaign, Illinois. This marks the inaugural WBIT, which is an annual 32-team postseason invitation tournament for women's basketball that is owned and funded by the NCAA. College baseball, Missouri swept by number one Arkansas of the weekend, losing 6-0 on Saturday, 9-1 on Sunday. Kansas State took a 12-6 come from behind victory over Missouri State on Saturday and finished off the sweep with an 11-3 victory over the Bears on Sunday. Four players homeward as number three Central Missouri won its 11th consecutive game on Saturday, cruising to a 16-4 seven-inning win over Washburn. Washburn came back on Sunday with a three-run homer in the bottom of the eighth to win the series finale 10-9. College of the Ozarks split a doubleheader with Mission University on Saturday, grabbing the first game 7-2, falling 5-3 in the second game. Trey Riley of St. James was 0-3 in each game for College of the Ozarks. Columbia College rolled to a doubleheader win over Harris Stowe on Saturday, taking down the Hornets 24-1 and 16-2. Chase McCaig from Herman was 0-2 with a run scored on Saturday. Cougars then finished off the sweep, taking Harris Stowe 19-2 on Sunday. McCaig went 0-1. ECC Baseball swept a series with North Arkansas College over the weekend, winning 7-3 and 9-8 with a walk-off two-run homer on Saturday and then 14-11 on Sunday. Mason Snyder from Pacific pitched in relief in Game 1 Saturday. Anthony Broker from St. Clair earned the win, going three and a third innings to pick up the win in the second game on Saturday. Emporia State fell to Rogers State 6-4 on Saturday afternoon. T.J. Rockerbomber from Herman 1-4 with a walk and a run scored for Emporia. The Hornets then outlasted Rogers State in a pitcher's duel 1-0 Sunday afternoon to take the series two games to one. Rockerbomber was 0-2. Hannibal LaGrange fell twice at Missouri Baptist on Saturday 9-3 and 21-6. Isaiah Helsher from Union was 2-5 for five with two walks and an RBI on the day for Hannibal LaGrange. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader for Mineral Area, 5-3 and 10-0 on Saturday. Sam Pauley from Washington, 0-4 for 4 with two walks and a run on the day for State Fair. Missouri S&T split a doubleheader with Drury on Saturday, taking the first game 11-5, losing the second game 14-2. Tommy Reether from Washington, 1-5 for 5 with a walk on the day Saturday. Myers finished with a series split after winning 9-1 on Sunday. St. Louis Community College lost twice at home on Saturday to Crowder, 9-4 and 12-1. The Archers then went on the road to Crowder on Sunday, losing 10-0 and 11-4. Missouri-St. Louis swept Lewis University, 9-6 and 11-9 in a doubleheader on Saturday afternoon. Trent Anderson from Herman pitched the final two innings, giving up no runs on a hit and two strikeouts and two walks to earn his second save of the year in that second game. The Tritons won the series finale, 9-5 on Sunday. In softball, number 11 Missouri dropped their Saturday matinee against number 8 Tennessee 8 2. Tennessee pitching continued to dominate on Sunday as they finished off a sweep of Missouri in a 4 0 victory. 
Visiting Illinois State, turned back Missouri State 7-2 on Saturday at Killian Stadium. Kayla Ulrich from Sullivan got the start at first base for the Lady Bears and went 3-4 for four with her first collegiate home run, a two-run shot in the bottom of the seventh. Missouri State then pounded out a season night 13 hits and got a six-inning home run from Annie Mueller to seal the deal in a 7-4 win over Illinois State on Sunday. Ulrich was 3-4 for four with an RBI in that game. Evangel Softball took both ends of a doubleheader with Bethany College on Saturday, 10-1 and 1-0. Naomi Perkins from Steelville, 1 for 5 with a run and an RBI on the day for Evangel. Fonbon Softball dropped both games in a doubleheader with Rose Holman, 6-5 in 8 innings and 8-5 on Saturday. Madeline Holtmeyer from Washington, 0 for 2 in Game 1. They lost the home doubleheader with Dubuque on Sunday, 10-7 and 7-2. Jefferson College lost a pair of nail biters to St. Charles Community College on Saturday, falling 1 0 in nine innings and then losing 2 0 in the second game. On Sunday, the Vikings won a doubleheader for Metropolitan Community College in Kansas City by scores of 15 2 and 19 4. Sophia Wyrick from Sullivan, 0 for 2 in the first game with St. Charles Saturday, 0 for 4 in the first game against Metropolitan on Sunday. Kansas got a two-run single in the fourth inning and turned three double plays and a 2 nothing win against number 13 Baylor on Saturday. Addison Purvis from Sullivan was 0 for 1 with a walk as DH for the Jayhawks. They finished off the sweep with a 1 nothing victory on Sunday as Purvis drew another walk as a pinch hitter. Lindenwood softball dropping two close games at Tennessee State on Saturday, falling 2-1 and 5-4 in eight innings. Lions dropped their final game at Tennessee State 6-3 on Sunday. Hannah Johanning scored a run as a pinch runner in that game on Sunday. MSU West Plains split with three rivers on the road Saturday, losing 1-0 and pitching a 4-0 shutout in Game 2. They won both games with Lyon College on Sunday, 6-0 and 12-4. Alexis Funkhauser from Sullivan was 1-for-6 with two RBI against three rivers, 3-for-6 with an RBI in a run versus Lyon. Rockhurst softball lost a home doubleheader to McKendree University, 4-3 in eight innings and then 7-1 on Saturday. Emma Vodnanski from Washington 0-for-4 on the day for Rockhurst. They split a doubleheader with Umsel on Sunday, losing 8-5, winning 3-0. Vodnanski was 0-for-2. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader at Metropolitan, 7-4 and 3-0 on Saturday. Myla Inman from Washington, 1-for-5 with a run and two RBI on the day. The Roadrunners then dropped a home doubleheader with Crowder on Sunday, 13-1 and 15-8. UHSP split with Westminster College on Saturday, 10-1 win in the first game, 4-2 loss in the second. Hannah Duggan from Pacific played right field in both games, was 0-2 at the plate in Game 2. University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy also split with Culver Stockton on Sunday, winning the first game 9-2, dropping the nightcap 8-0. Congratulations going out to Ryan Herman from St. Clair, who placed 7th at 285 pounds to close out the 2024 NCAA Division II Wrestling National Championships in Park City, Kansas over the weekend, wrestling for Maryville University. In outdoor track at the CMU Open on Saturday on the women's side, Madison Dixon from Herman, running for William Woods, was 12th in the 100-meter dash. Sailor Richardson from Owensville and William Woods was 14th. In the 200 meters, Richardson was 12th and Dixon was 19th. In the triple jump, Lauren Davis of Steelville and Evangel University was 5th. In the shot put, Kaylin Powers from Herman and Hannibal LaGrange was 2nd. Molly Pritchard from Pacific and State Fair Community College was 5th. Powers was 4th in the discus and Pritchard was 15th. Powers was 5th in the hammer throw. College schedule for today, East Central Softball will be at Culver Stockton to take on their JV in a doubleheader at 2 o'clock. In college golf, the Umsel men will be at the Oak Tree Invitational, William Woods Women in the State Fair Community College Invitational in Sedalia today. Congratulations going out to Herman High School senior Jill Rude on signing to play volleyball at Jefferson College in Hillsboro next year. Looking at the scoreboard from the local sports over the weekend, the Four Rivers Baseball Tournament Games at Union on Saturday. It was Sullivan getting by Pacific 4-2 in a great game, and St. Clair lost to Union 15-0. At Owensville, St. James defeated New Haven 6-1, Owensville over Herman by a score of 5-1. At the Troy Classic, Washington losing twice, falling to Timberland 9-4, and Parkway West 8-1. Other games, Borgia defeated Wright City 11-3 in Varsity, 21-0 in JV. Cuba Baseball was in a round robin at Salem on Saturday. They fell to Salem 10-0 and lost to Vienna 11-8. At the Windsor JV Tournament, Valley beat Pacific 8-4, Windsor over Pacific 12-1. Girls Soccer at the Warrington Soccer Classic, Washington defeated the host school 8-0. Sullivan over the St. Louis Patriots 2-0. 
Washington beats St. Clair 3-2. Sullivan over Ellsbury 3-2. And St. Clair beats St. Louis Christian, the Patriots, by a score of 3-0. At the Rolla Tournament on Saturday, it was Pacific over Rolla 5-2. Springfield Catholic beat Borgia 3-0. Pacific and Springfield Catholic played a 0-0 tie. And Rolla over Borgia 3-2. Middle school volleyball at the Bland 8th grade tournament. Herman taking first place, beating Bland in two sets. Eugene was third as they downed Chamoy. At the St. James 8th grade tournament, Hawkins Junior High out of Jackson beat St. Clair in two sets for the championship. Salem over St. James in two sets for third place. Looking at the local schedule for today, high school baseball, Bell and Bourbon are playing in the Stoutland tournament this week. Bell opens up today at 5 o'clock against Lakeway at Tiger Field. Bourbon will not play until Tuesday. They'll take on Dixon at 4 o'clock on Tuesday and then Stoutland at 6 o'clock in the pool play part of that tournament. The Four Rivers Conference Tournament will wrap up on Wednesday. Games to be played at Sullivan at 4 o'clock. It'll be St. James and Owensville for consolation. Sullivan and Union for the championship at 6. Games at St. Clair on Wednesday. New Haven and Herman at 4 o'clock for 7th place. Pacific and St. Clair for 3rd place. Washington is uh, in pool play today at the Troy Classic. They'll take on Hannibal at 4.30 today at Troy. At the Windsor JV Baseball Tournament today, DeSoto takes on Pacific at 6 o'clock. Girls soccer coming up today. Sullivan begins play in the Lutheran St. Charles Tournament as they will take on University City at 6.15. They'll have a game on Tuesday against Northwest and Thursday against Lutheran St. Charles. Other games today, Owensville at Pacific, Varsity only at 5. St. James at Eugene, Varsity only at 5. Union at St. Clair, Varsity then JV at 5 o'clock this evening. High school track today, Sullivan hosting an early season quad meet with Bourbon, St. Clair, and Union. That will get underway at 3 o'clock with the field events, running events at 4. Middle school track today, Bland will be at Lynn, and that meet starts at 3.30. High school golf today, Bell and Owensville are at a match at Cuba Lakes Classic at 4 o'clock. Borge and Union in the Father Tolton Invitational Tournament at 10 this morning. Potosi at St. James for a dual meet at 4 this afternoon. Middle school volleyball coming up tonight. Bland will be at New Haven at 5.30. Eugene at Owensville at 5 o'clock. That's your look at sports on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. Hi, this is Nick from Schmidt Auto Center. As everything in the world has become more expensive, you can count on us to get you the very best value possible for your hard-earned dollar. Whether that's for a pre-owned vehicle or to get the one that you have repaired, we're here for you. Call Schmidt Auto Center at 573-468-2233. Come by and see us at 750 South Service Road or check our inventory at SchmidtAutoCenter.com. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Nick. It is currently 22 minutes away from 8 o'clock. Uh, 27 here at studios of uh, KTUI, Sullivan Bank Studios here on uh, Elmont Road. And it's 24 at the Sullivan Regional Airport. And I'm going to see if I've got, uh, okay, yeah, I'm turn turn Robert's mic on. As you can see, uh, maybe, <laughs> if I can get this thing straight down. There, you there go. we go. <clears throat> Uh, okay, where it says Sam Scott, that's not Sam Scott. Where it says Bobby D, that's not Bobby D. So <laughs> don't panic. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get it figured out. Yeah, we'll get it figured out. Uh, Sam's son, Robert, across the way from me. And most people, I think, have, have heard uh, or seen on, on Facebook uh, about your dad. Right. And uh, we're, uh, again, uh, continuing our prayers uh, for uh, full and speedy recovery. Right. So uh, he'll be out for a little while. So I'll be man the chair over here, and we'll have uh, we've, a, we've got some g- different guests lined up to yeah. uh, come in and help you out. So we'll have a kind of a rotation on the far seat over there. Well, neither you or I had any time to go to the movies over the weekend. No. So we'll talk about that a bit. First off, I want to let everybody know that Ann Carroll used to work for uh, the Cardinals yeah. and Anheuser Busch and coordinate all their broadcast stuff. She has a birthday today. Kay Bilo. Sally Sailings and Gilberta Record all have birthdays today. Uh, at 8.30, I'm scheduled to have Corporal Dallas Thompson from the Missouri State Highway Patrol 
coming in for a visit. And then um, somebody from Missouri Baptist Solomon Hospital. I don't know who. Okay. I'll have to. I've been trying to get uh, through in some of Sam's stuff here to to see uh, if they, he had been notified and if I have to do a Zoom or okay. whatever. So we'll we'll try to get that figured out uh, and have that for you at nine ten this morning. Um, nobody got really rich over the weekend. Well, darn. I was hopeful. This I was didn't hopeful work out. it was me, but <clears throat> yeah. I also don't buy any lottery tickets, so yeah. Well, that's there's uh, dar- there's even less of a chance it's ever going to be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, your odds are a little bit more than one one in two hundred and some odd million. Or yeah, whatever right. It is. Uh, Powerball will uh, get uh, six hundred forty-five million after nobody won on Saturday night, or you can take the three hundred seven point three million cash buyout. Uh, the winning numbers for Powerball Saturday were 12, 23, 44, 57, 61. The Powerball was 5. The power play was 2X. There were three players that won a million dollars, getting all five white ball numbers. A ticket in New Jersey, Michigan, and South Carolina. Those folks are celebrating probably still today. And the Mega Millions is going to be up to eight hundred and seventy-five million. Wow! After nobody won Friday night, the cash uh, option will be four hundred and thirteen point five million. Uh, that drawing on Tuesday uh, for the new drawing. The numbers on Friday were thirteen, twenty-five, fifty, fifty-one, and sixty-six. The Mega Ball was six. Twenty-eighth consecutive drawing with no ticket matching all six numbers. So. So if you you ever win, are you taking the, uh, the annuity option? Are you t- taking the lump sum option? You know, because to me, eight hundred million, four hundred million, it's all the same thing. It's a, it's lot, a lot of money, of money that I would never have. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I would imagine at my age, I'm probably taking the cash option. Oh, you're not going to try to pull off the thirty years? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, no, I, I don't. Uh, <laughs> the odds are, uh, I probably wouldn't see the end of that. So, uh, yeah, I think I'll do the cash option. And it, what? I, I figured out somewhere along the line, um, I think the government takes out like 28% right off the bat. Right. I think the Missouri is still going to end up owing them. And when you'll you still owe money yeah, when you do your tax return down the road, even though they take that initial tax hit out. Uh, and, and I think Missouri's like four and an eighth or right. something like right. that, four and a quarter. Uh, the percentage you have to pay there. So you can figure roughly 32% of that cash option is coming out in taxes. Right. So, you know. I, I figure you're going to be left with about half half of the cash option once everything's said and done. Yeah. Um, I think where a lot of people run into issues with that is they don't, they say, okay, well, yeah, they're going to take those taxes out initially, but they don't think that they'll owe any more tax no, on Oh, they're it. going to. And I think that's a misunderstanding. Right. They don't get a tax lawyer. So don't don't uh, or something like that. Don't spend all of your money that first year because yeah. you still have a hefty tax bill at the end of the year. Yeah. So uh, you know, hire a tax professional like one across from me over here uh, to look at that. If you're if if somebody even if you win other lottery right. prizes, you know the fifty thousand or you know right. or the one million or whatever it might be. Um, you know, there's more than just that initial Absolutely. outlay, so you know, be careful with that. Uh, we don't, don't want anybody to go bankrupt you after know, I, win the I, lottery. I've seen too many stories, and you know, the, these people they win the lottery and they're bankrupt two, three years oh, later. Oh yeah, yeah, they give it all away, and they, you know, relatives coming out of the woodwork. Oh, I yeah. need help with this, yeah. and you know, you know, my uh, my you know cousins, uncles, brothers, sisters, b- boyfriends, <laughs> mother-in-law, or something has uh, needs some money. So, anyway, uh, back to the movies. Uh, Kung Fu Panda 4. Barrett's been really begging to go to that one. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> your dad and I talked about this last week. And uh, and before everything happened, he was like, you know, he like, Barrett, I think he, Barrett really wants me to take him. And I think he kind of planned to. Yeah. But uh, didn't get to that. But it took in $30 million over the weekend. Uh, it has pulled in about uh, right around $108 million domestically. Uh, which uh, was is pretty good for the uh, fourth installment of that franchise. Dune Part Two was not far behind at 29.1 million, only down 37 percent from last weekend. It's pulled in about 205 million domestically, and about 500 million worldwide. Uh, Arthur the King. Now this is a newcomer, new release this week. Was third, 
It'll drop me all the way down to seven and a half million, but it didn't cost that much to make. So the studio was expecting something in the eight to ten million dollar range for the first take. A little bit lower than that, but not too bad. It's low production cost uh, and some international pre-sales should yield profits. Another new movie called Love Lies Bleeding uh, opened in uh, 1,362 theaters to 2.5 million. It was down the list at number six. Uh, it's a pulpy 80 set western thriller about an isolated gym manager played by Kristen Stewart and a bodybuilder played by Katie O'Brien passing through town. And it doesn't have a lot of draw for me. I don't yeah. Know. Uh, number three, we mentioned Arthur the King. Imaginary was number four at 5.6. Cabrini, I think it came out last week. Uh, that's 2.8 million. Then Love Lies Bleeding. The uh, Bob Marley film, One Love at 2.3. A uh, film called One Life uh, at 1.7. Here's another new one. I'm surprised. Well, maybe not. The American Society of Magical Negroes. Huh. Interesting title. Yeah. Opened in over 1,100 theaters, made an estimated 1.3 million. According to exit data, 52% of the opening weekend audience was black. The movie is a satire about a secret society of black people dedicated to making white lives easier. Starring Justice Smith and David Allen Greer. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, let's see. And the coming in at number 10 was Ordinary Angels pulling in about you know, it. No, I haven't heard of most of these movies. I, I find that. Um, you know, back whenever everybody just watched regular television with commercials and everything, you would you would see um, trailers for these all the time. Uh, nowadays, I don't watch much TV with commercials on it. Yeah. Um, so I don't get to know what movies are even coming out until they're out, and I see the sign at the movie theater. Well, and 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 two, I think the experiment of releasing them. At the theater and streaming at the same time. I, yeah. I, I don't think that experiment worked out as well as they were hoping it would. Um, and so you don't see many movies now being released, streaming and in the theaters at the well, same time. I think time. there was a big backlash with the movie theaters as yeah. well. Yeah, I um, think there was. So, uh, But yeah, and I think there's a, a couple. I think the, the latest installment in the Ghostbuster series is supposed to be coming out in a week or two. And I think there's another one. I uh, can't remember the name of it, but it's supposed to be, a, I, I wouldn't necessarily say a blockbuster, but yeah. it's supposed to be a fairly uh, fairly popular movie. So uh, they're, they're supposed to be coming out here, I believe, toward the end of the month. Uh, so we'll kind of wait and see what happens there. Um, now, we hear stories all the time about how bad things are in, in our country. Right. And most of them are, you know, they're hitting right on the head. But things aren't so great north of us either. Yeah. Uh, Canada, of course, under Mr. Trudeau, has had, had their issues. Right. A lot of them similar to ones that we face. Um, and, of course, they have much stricter gun laws in Canada. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So here's an interesting story, and I don't know how well this would fly in our country. As car thefts have spiked in Toronto, local police are prescribing new safety measures so the locals can avoid violent encounters with thieves. One of the recent bits of advice, including Toronto police telling residents of the town of uh, Etobicoke to leave their car key fobs near the front door to avoid being attacked in their homes by potential burglars. Okay. Yeah. So just make it easy for them to sure. steal the cars. Put so it right don't... out there, a little sign on, here's my keys, just take them and go. According to police, the number of car thefts in the city has more than doubled in recent years. In 2023, more than 12,000 vehicles were reported stolen. In 2019, just over 5,000. Thieves have begun breaking into houses to steal keys in order to get the cars, prompting controversial prevention advice from Toronto Police Constable Marco Riccardi at a town hall meeting last month. During the town hall, he advised the residents to leave their car keys near the front doors of their houses so that they do not have to confront violent criminals who he noted often have real guns. And of course, the homeowners are not allowed to have right, exactly. real guns. Uh, he said to prevent the possibility of being attacked in your home, leave your key fobs at your front door. 
because they're breaking into your home to steal your car. They don't want anything else. Huh. Well, you know, for me, most of the time I fall asleep in bed, um, still have my jeans on, and my keys are still in my pocket. So somebody breaks into my house, um, if you're looking for my, for, for my keys, most likely they're sitting there in my pocket while I'm sleeping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my gun is right beside my bed, too. Um, yeah, he says a lot of the of the uh, criminals that we are arresting have guns on them, and they're not toy guns. They're real guns, Whoa. and they're loaded. Wow, I should imagine that. Uh, Toronto police sent out a memo clarifying the comments on Wednesday of last week. Uh, the memo also provided additional home invasion prevention tips. Get a big dog, maybe. Um, it stated an officer at a recent community meeting suggested that people leave the keys to their vehicles in a Faraday bag by the front door. While well-meaning, there are also other ways to prevent auto theft motivated home invasions. Uh, for additional context, in Toronto, home invasions and break-in and enters for auto theft occurrences rose 400% last year. Man, police are concerned about an escalation in violence where all sorts of weapons and firearms are being used to steal vehicles. And that includes home invasions. Uh, included instructions to park vehicles in your garage if possible. Ensure your driveway is well lit and keep exterior lights on all night. Install a home security system. Activate alarm on stay when home and away when out. Do not post on social media when you will be away on holiday. Well, that's a good one. And right that's there. a lot of that's a problem that yeah. we have here in America. Um, so anyway, it kind of goes on. But I'm like, uh, I'm just not real into this leaving my keys by the front door thing. I, I've always told people, when you go on vacation, don't post all your pictures on Facebook until you get back home. Yeah. Um, everybody's posting as things are happening, and everyone knows you're not home. Hey. Your home's a good target. The other thing I have, have wrong with that, uh, uh, I find wrong with that, is they tell you to park your car in your garage. Where are you supposed to put all your junk if you park your car in your garage then? Well, maybe you're a lucky person that has a big garage. Oh, okay. Yeah, or okay. get an outbuilding. You know, that's that's a solution there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Build a big shed. There you go. And that's where you can put all your junk. But it's just not it's not convenient. Right. If you have to put it in a shed away from the house. Right. You know, or if you're like us, you have a two car garage with one car in it, <laughs> with all the rest of yeah, with the tables and the yeah the yeah. shelves and everything. Well, we've got a two car garage and there's no car in it. <laughs> Yeah. No, I have to make sure there's room for at least one car there in our garage. Yes. And it's not yours. And it's not mine. No, <laughs> no. I. The only time my uh, truck gets in the garage is when my wife is gone yeah. for, uh, you know, an overnight thing or a, w a week or a weekend or now whatever. Now, for us, wh whenever it gets to be, well, last week we had the, the potential threat of hail. Yeah. I, I uh, got in there and um, cleared out a, a spot so we could pull my wife's truck into the garage and prevent it from hail damage. Now, my car, it's already got hail damage from a few years back, so who cares if it sits outside, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's not worth saving. Right. Yeah, one of those things. No, my uh, my vehicles get sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah, the, the garage belongs to my wife. There so, you go. Yeah, that's, that's her part of the house. All right, so I'm sure you heard about the uh, bill in Congress uh, attempting to ban TikTok. Yeah, I've heard it going for about a week now. Yeah, now the popular video sharing app t t TikTok could be soon banned in the United States as lawmakers say it could be a national security threat uh, to, to its ownership by Chinese companies. Uh, Skylar Adkins finds herself making TikToks as part of her daily routine as an employee for True Soul Boutique in Huntington, West Virginia. Uh, she said that it's a way to showcase at the store what the store offers and draw in customers. Well, plenty of people say, I saw you on TikTok and I wanted to come in. I really like this outfit you had on. Can you show me where it is? The app has proven that it's not just for silly dances. We use it as a form of free advertising, the Atkins said. Um, there's also a boutique in Charleston that uses the app. Uh, we go live on TikTok every Wednesday evening, and we get people from all over the place on there, the boutique, the boutique owner said. Uh, now, of course, the app is not banned yet. The House passed a bill Wednesday that would ban TikTok if its owner, based in China, does not sell its stake in the company within six months of the bill being enacted. The Senate is now considering the bill, but as usual, I don't think it's going to pass the Senate. Um, it would be one less outlet that we can use to get all of our stuff that we want uh, out there, out there, that they should said. 
And it's got, like the Donald said, if you ban TikTok, and then that just makes that opens the door for another app. Facebook more popular, and you know he's you not know, a big fan of Facebook. He I, doesn't like Zuckerberg. I, I'm I'm torn on this. I don't think people should be using TikTok if it's owned by the by China, but I don't think the government's got the uh, authority to say no. You can't be using it. Well, um, they they banned stuff on Facebook and Twitter right. before Elon bought it, right. uh, and now that's going to court. Well. Some, there were some successful challenges to that, and I think, uh, if I remember right, I don't know if I've got a story here, I saw something over the weekend that a judge said the federal government violated the law by conspiring with uh, Facebook and X and other social media providers to, uh, um, I don't know if it banned or, or you know, deleted or, per, you know, prevented uh, certain things. I, uh, I, I feel posted. like Facebook has the authority to do whatever they want on Facebook. They are the owners. That is their Private business. Private company. Yeah. I don't believe the government can tell them to what to ban and what to keep hush hush on it. But yeah. I don't know. Well, I'm I mean, glad I'm not the one in yeah, charge. Yeah, Zuckerberg, I think, agreed with him. And yeah. my my thing is, he probably got a big payout for probably. That, but, yeah. You know, I don't think Zuckerberg's the type of guy that does anything for free. Um, this is a strange story. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this uh, young uh, Mizzou student that's been missing in Nashville for over a week. Uh, you know, I, I think did would he go into a bar and? Well, he was at yeah. Luke uh, Luke Bryan's bar on Broadway right, Street go. down in in um, in Nashville. Uh, he was on a fraternity trip. Uh, Friday, March the eighth, he was asked to leave Luke's Thirty Two Bridge, which is Luke Bryan's bar on Broadway. But he had only been served one alcoholic drink and two waters. Uh, according to a statement from the uh, restaurant group that manages the bar, at 9.35 p.m., our security team made a decision based on our conduct standards to escort him from the venue through our Broadway exit at the front of the building. He was followed down the stairs with one member of his party. The individual with him did not exit and returned upstairs, the company said in a statement released uh, just recently. Now, there was a new, um, something new, that his um, bank card was discovered on an embankment with the Cumberland River over the weekend. No. Uh, surveillance video, going back to that uh, last Friday, um, a video from the downtown smoke and vape shop on Church Street caught him stumbling and falling in a parking lot at 3rd Avenue and Church Street around 9.45 p.m. Then at 9.47, surveillance footage caught him crossing First Avenue North to Gay Street. His last phone ping was near James Robertson Parkway and Gay Street between 9.55 and 10 p.m. Detectives said the last phone conversation he had was with one of his friends, who was uh, was also during that same time period, but the ping covered about a two-mile radius and really didn't give them a direction of travel or details where he might have gone. A friend of the 22-year-old called 911 on Saturday after saying he went to the Central Police Precinct and called the Sheriff's Office to file a missing persons report. Um, the Nat Nashville Urban Search and Rescue Team has been searching the area around his last known location near the river. Uh, there, according to investigators last Thursday, at this point there was no indication of foul play or him being involved in any type of fight or argument. Then on Sunday they said his bank card was found on the embankment between Gay Street and the Cumberland River amid the ongoing search effort. Uh, people all over the place have been looking. A couple of TikTokers have been searching uh, in a wooded area that goes down to the Cumberland River, which is where they said they found his card. His family is on, uh, on site there looking around for him. They also talked to the woman who made the discovery. Uh, so there's, there's quite a bit there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Um, doesn't sound good. It doesn't. Um, like I said, he uh, they said they had the the uh, restaurant company said they had footage in the bar. He'd only been served one alcoholic drink, and he had two waters. And I guess he was getting a little out of hand in some other ways. Yeah. Uh, his according to their conduct policy, he was doing stuff that didn't meet that. Right. That's why they asked him to leave. But then. The other video said that he was seen stumbling, uh, falling down, yeah. and that sort of thing. So I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, 
This one, I don't know that this is going to end well. No, unfortunately, doesn't sound like it. All right, well, we're coming up at eight o'clock. We'll have a check of news coming up at the top of the hour, local news and all that coming up, sports. And uh, again, Dallas Thompson is scheduled to be my guest at eight thirty this morning. We'll see if he's able to make it in. Uh, this is KTUI 1560 AM, Sullivan, Missouri. You can get us on TuneIn. Also, check us out here on YouTube as well. It is 8 o'clock. We currently have 27 degrees. And here at the studios of KTUI, the Sullivan Bank Studios, it's time for the news. Hey, news. I'm Ryan Daniels. Early results from Russia's presidential election show President Vladimir Putin winning with 88% of the vote. His victory was all but guaranteed. At the same time, Putin is claiming that he had agreed to a prisoner swap involving imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny before he died. Former Vice President Mike Pence argues that it must be voters who make the final decision about Donald Trump in the U.S. While Pence has refused to endorse his former boss, and while he hopes all January 6th criminals are held accountable, Pence stops short of calling Trump criminally liable for what happened that day. The people that ransacked the Capitol need to be held to the fullest account of the law. I believe that they are. But the judgment about the president's efforts that day, I think, can be left to the American people. Pence spoke on CBS's Face the Nation Sunday. He said he does not believe Trump should be calling January 6th rioters hostages. North Korea is firing more missiles over the sea. South Korea's military says a missile was fired early Monday local time. The Concorde is coming back to its home in the New York City Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. This after a six-month restoration. Well, it's a beautiful plane. It looks much bigger than I remember. The plane was used to carry passengers from New York to London at supersonic speed. The trip would usually take about three hours as opposed to eight on a regular transatlantic flight. Tickets to fly on the French-made aircraft cost about ten grand back in the 1990s. The Concorde aircraft was retired in 2003. Current leaders at the West Point Military Academy believe duty, honor, country is more of a motto than a mission statement, so they are making a change. From now on, the West Point mission statement will read simply Army Values. It's a noted effort toward more inclusivity. This is USA News. You've been working hard, doing the right thing and paying your taxes and putting your hard-earned money in the Medicare piggy bank all your life. And now it's time to break the piggy bank and get something back. Medicare. If you didn't know it, Medicare is health insurance for people over 65. And you've paid for it with your tax dollars. Medicare plans now have more benefits than ever. That's good news, especially if you're like me and looking forward to paying as little as possible for good health insurance. Call and find out what Medicare plan is best for you. Save your time. It's valuable. We've already done the research for you. And in one quick phone call, you can learn how to get the best Medicare plan designed exactly for you. Hey, it's one of the most important decisions in your life. Let us help you through it. Here's our number. Call 65 Plus Medicare now. 800-778-8214. 800-778-8214. That's 800-778-8214. The death of Nex Benedict on February 8th in Oklahoma is triggering a wave of outrage and concern, particularly within the LGBTQ community. The Oklahoma teenager was involved in an altercation in their high school bathroom, and authorities have confirmed the teen passed away the following day due to an overdose, which was ruled a suicide by the medical examiner. The White House moving to eradicate junk fees for college students and borrowers of student loans. USA's John Schaefer. As outlined in the president's 2025 budget, proposal, the administration aims to eliminate student loan origination fees, which are a percentage of the loan amount designated as a processing fee. Additionally, the plan seeks to address college banking fees and automatic charges for textbooks. The Mega Millions jackpot getting close to a billion dollars. Lottery officials said no tickets matched all six numbers drawn Friday night, so the grand prize jumps to an estimated $875 million for the Mega Millions Tuesday drawing this week. Meanwhile, the Powerball jackpot, set for a drawing Monday night, is now over $600 million. In Kung Fu Panda 4, edging out Dune Part 2 by less than a million dollars for the top spot in this weekend's box office, Kung Fu Panda 4 took in an estimated $30 million in its second week in theaters. Dune Part 2 brought home $29.1 million in its third week. The Mark Wahlberg film Arthur the King opened in third place with $7.5 million. I'm Ryan Daniels, USA News. 
Do you have a story to tell? Bring your story to life with audiobooks. Great stories deserve great storytelling. Audiobook Network provides professional voice actors and full production services for every author's manuscript. From narration, production, and editing to distribution, promotion, and sales, Audiobook Network handles everything. If you have a print book, ebook, or even a manuscript, call Audiobook Network now and get our free audiobook guide. 800 734 1229. 800 734 1229. You deserve extraordinary care close to home. From primary care to advanced specialties right here in Sullivan and access to all that BJC Healthcare has to offer. We're here to provide the care you need. Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital and BJC Healthcare. Care that is comprehensive, coordinated, and completely about you. Learn more at MissouriBaptistSullivan.org. With news on Missouri Net, I'm Marshall Griffin. The main expansion work on I-70 in Missouri will begin this summer, but preliminary work begins tonight, weather pending. Crews will begin drilling core samples of old pavement and the geology underneath along I-70 as part of the planning for the $2.8 billion project. MoDOT Director Patrick McKenna says the project is moving quickly and is ahead of the normal pace for interstate highway work. It would typically take two to three years, maybe as many as three to five years to go from funded status to project on the ground on the interstate. It's very complicated to get these things done. Eleven state troopers are currently in Texas supporting law enforcement efforts along the U.S.-Mexico border, along with 48 Missouri National Guard troops. And the National Weather Service has confirmed a weak EF-0 tornado swept through Charlac in St. Louis County Thursday. Damage was confined to trees, fencing, roof, and siding. This is Missouri Net. Missouri's black vulture numbers are increasing, and their aggressive nature can cause problems for livestock producers. If you suspect a black vulture problem on your farm, let the USDA and the Missouri Department of Agriculture help you. Reimbursement for necropsy and death loss is available to farmers if livestock loss is determined to have occurred because of black vultures. The black vulture remains a federally protected bird in the USA, so contact the USDA or Missouri Department of Agriculture for mitigation options. For more information, visit agriculture.mo.gov. That's agriculture.mo.gov. Hey, you. Yes, you. We've got something important to share because we believe everyone deserves support. 988 is for you. Whether you're dealing with thoughts of suicide, facing a serious crisis, or if you just need someone to talk to, it's not just a lifeline, it's your lifeline. Call, text, or chat 988 because everyone deserves support and you are not alone. Brought to you by the Missouri Department of Mental Health. New Testament Baptist Church in Sullivan is starting a new addiction recovery ministry called Life Issues. It's a biblical approach to the 12 steps, bringing scriptural principles into personal focus and making them come alive for transformational living. Whether you struggle with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, or relationships, you'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through this program. Life Issues will meet weekly on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. at New Testament Baptist Church. You're not alone. To find out more, contact New Testament Baptist Church at 573-468-3334. Earn 5.51 annual percentage yield on a 7-month CD at Sullivan Bank. Use our CD calculator on SullivanBank.com and see how much you could earn. Experience great rates and a step up in service. We are waiting to greet you with a smile. Annual percentage yield of 5.51 APY is accurate as of December 26, 2023. $1,000 minimal balance required to earn stated APY. Penalty may be imposed for early withdrawal, which will reduce earnings on the account. Interest compounded and credited quarterly. Rate subject to change at any time. Available at all locations. Looking at our local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank studios of KTUI Radio. A fatality accident occurred in Washington County at 10.13 p.m. Saturday on Route E near Wicket Road. A 2004 Honda CT750 motorcycle operated by 30-year-old Adam J. Sapp of Irondale traveling west on Route E went out of control off the right side of the roadway, struck a mailbox and overturned. Adam J. Sapp, 30, of Irondale, was pronounced dead at the scene. A passenger, 55-year-old Bonnie J. Sapp of Cadet, Missouri, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Washington County Memorial Hospital by Washington County Ambulance District. The Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.40 p.m. on Sunday in Crawford County near No. 10 Grand Oaks. A 2023 Yamaha motorcycle operated by a 13-year-old juvenile from Solvin traveled off the right side of the roadway and struck several trees ejecting the driver. 
The 13-year-old male juvenile from Sullivan suffered serious injuries and was flown to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. At 7.20 p.m. Saturday in Dent County at 119 Highway DD, a go-kart operated by a 7-year-old male juvenile from Rolla made an abrupt turn causing the passenger to be ejected. The passenger, 31-year-old Andrea M. Bowers of Rolla, suffered moderate injuries and was taken to Phelps Health for treatment. Highway Patrol reported an accident at 5.50 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on northbound Route in near Finney Lake Drive. A 2003 Honda Accord driven by a 16-year-old female juvenile from Villa Ridge was traveling north on Route End too fast for the Kirby Road. Across the center line of the roadway, overcorrected to the right, the vehicle began rotating clockwise, went off the right side of the roadway and overturned several times. The 16-year-old female juvenile driver from Villa Ridge suffered moderate injuries, was taken by Merrimack Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in Washington. A 16-year-old female juvenile passenger suffered serious injuries and was taken by Merrimack Ambulance District to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. There was an accident at 4.08 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County on Old Highway K west of Little Indian Creek Road. A 2004 Ford F-150 pickup operated by Stephanie L. Woods, 38 of Lundell, Traveling eastbound on Old Highway K, driver failed to maintain control of the vehicle, went off the left side of the highway. Stephanie Woods suffered serious injuries, was taken to Mercy Hospital in Washington by St. Clair Ambulance. She was not wearing her seatbelt. A five-year-old juvenile female passenger suffered serious injuries. She was taken by St. Clair Ambulance to Mercy Hospital in St. Louis. Stephanie L. Woods was subsequently arrested by the Highway Patrol on a charge of driving while intoxicated and endangering the welfare of a child. She was treated at Mercy Hospital in Washington and released. There was an accident at 11.45 a.m. Saturday in Texas County on U.S. 63, seven miles north of Licking. A 2008 GMC Acadia operated by 63-year-old Janet M. Hagee of St. Louis traveling north on Highway 63 went off the right side of the roadway and struck a rock embankment. Janet M. Hagee, 63, of St. Louis, suffered minor injuries, was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. A 15-year-old juvenile male passenger from Bourbon also suffered minor injuries and was taken to Texas County Hospital by Texas County EMS. They were both wearing their seatbelts. The Highway Patrol reported an arrest at 10.14 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County. 31-year-old Nicole A. Feldman of Washington arrested on a Franklin County warrant for driving while suspended. She was taken to the St. Louis County Jail and held without bond. 8.20 p.m. Sunday in St. Louis County, 29-year-old Eric R. Hartsfield of Pacific picked up on a Pacific PD nuisance violation times five, a Lincoln County failure to appear for conservation violation. He was taken to the Franklin County Adult Detention Facility and was bondable. At 8.14 p.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 25-year-old Alvaro Delator of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma was picked up for DWI. Failure to drive on the right half of the roadway and failure to stop at a stop sign, he was processed and released. 2.54 a.m. Sunday in Crawford County, 40-year-old Jeremy D. Jackson of Steelville arrested for felony possession of a controlled substance methamphetamine, misdemeanor possession, drug paraphernalia, failure to display valid plates on a motor vehicle and no taillights. He was taken to the Crawford County Jail and placed on 24-hour hold. 2.15 a.m. Sunday in Franklin County, Bradley R. Portner, 19, of Washington, arrested on a patrol charge of BWI. He was taken to the Washington Police Department, processed, and released. At 8.46 p.m. Saturday in Franklin County, 22-year-old Austin E. Davis of Ewing, Missouri, was arrested on a patrol charge for unlawful use of a weapon. He was taken to the St. Clair Police Department, processed, and released. 8.03 p.m. Saturday in Phelps County, 35-year-old Van T. Penton of Rolla arrested for felony DWI persistent offender, felony possession of controlled substance, oxycodone, and failure to have two operable headlamps. He was booked and released. At 5.54 p.m. on Saturday in Crawford County, 27-year-old Nicholas A. Harris of Springfield, Massachusetts was arrested for unlawful possession of controlled substance methamphetamine and unlawful possession of drug paraphernalia. He was booked and released. The Franklin County Highway Department has announced that Clemmy Road in the Gerald area would be closed beginning at 8 o'clock this morning through 3 p.m. on Tuesday for a cross-culvert replacement. The
The road will be closed at 3793 Clemmy Road and will be closed to all traffic including emergency vehicles. Roller Road in the St. Clair area will be closed beginning at 8 a.m. on Wednesday through 3 p.m. on Friday for cross culvert replacement. The closure will be two-tenths of a mile south of Highway AB with the nearest address of 1134 Roller Road. The road will be closed to all traffic including emergency vehicles. If you have any questions, contact the Franklin County Highway Department at 636-583-6361. The Sullivan City Council is scheduled to have their regular meeting coming up on Tuesday at 7 o'clock at Sullivan City Hall. Under requests and petitions, the Sullivan School District will have a request for uh, some road closures for their homecoming parade on Wednesday, September 25th from 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. And the uh, Downtown Business Partnership asking for road closures for their third Saturday events from 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. on April 20th, May 18th. June 15th, July 20th, September 21st, October 19th for flea markets and food booths. There'll be discussion of monthly bills totaling $1,822,756.65. Under ordinances, bill number 4020, sponsored by Alderman George Randy Counts, would approve an agreement with Axon body cameras for the police department through the 2023 Local Law Enforcement Block Grant Program with the Department of Public Safety. At a cost of $9,785.29, there will be no match required by the city. There is a closed session for real estate, litigation, personnel, and contractual negotiations. Again, an open meeting at 7 o'clock on Tuesday at Sullivan City Hall. That's your look at local news on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. Whether you love them or can't stand them, surprises are a part of life. Hi, I'm Donnie Greenwald, your Sullivan Edward Jones Financial Advisor, and I can help get you ready for whatever life throws at you, even the welcome surprises. As your needs change, we can change what you need to do to help you end up where you want to be. And while there is never a good time to experience unexpected costs, we can work together to help make them feel a little less unexpected. Call me at 573-468-6046 or visit edwardjones.com to get started today. Edward Jones, member SIPC. We all want to be the best version of ourselves, and Compass Health Network is your preferred provider for all things related to your health and well-being. From primary care and mental health services to pediatric and adult dental procedures, our professional and compassionate staff is here for you. Call us today at 844-853-8937 or visit compasshealthnetwork.org to find a location in your area. Compass Health Network is here to help you reach your health care goals. Funeral announcements on Mondays are brought to you by Healing Stone Monuments in Sullivan. At Healing Stone Monument Company, Brad Henson simplifies the process of designing and ordering a memorial without any sacrifice of quality, craftsmanship, or selection. Healing Stone offers beautiful custom design monuments and engravings, or you can choose from their extensive selection of stock design. Healing Stone Monuments are of the highest quality and they stand by their products and services. Call 468-6979 or stop in for a free consultation in creating a traditional or non-traditional memorial for your loved one. Healing Stone is located on Cumberland Way across from the library in Sullivan. In recent funeral announcements, Renee Nicole Ballore of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 44. She is survived by her parents, Ronald and Natalie Ballore, her sister, Rochelle Maples, and husband, Andrew of Bell, a brother, Ryan Ballore, and wife, Yasmin of Long Beach, California, two nephews, other relatives, and many friends. Funeral services for Renee Ballore will be held at 11 o'clock this morning at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud with burial at the Emanuel Lutheran Cemetery. Visitation will be held from 9 a.m. till services at 11 at the Emanuel Lutheran Church in Rosebud. All arrangements are under the direction of the Gotten Strader Funeral Home in Owensville. Wilbert Lee Franklin Adair of Cuba passed away Thursday, March 14th at the age of 88. He is survived by his sons, Michael Thomas Adair of Louisiana, Ryan and wife Tasha Sarabia of Marshfield, sisters Wilma Baus and Alberta Baus, both of Cuba, three grandchildren, nieces, nephews, great nieces and nephews, and many friends. Funeral services for Wilbert Adair will be held at 1 o'clock this afternoon at the Mizell Funeral Home in Cuba. Interment will follow at Kinder Cemetery in Cuba. Visitation will be held from 11 a.m. until time of services at 1 o'clock today at the Mizell Funeral Home in Cuba. Wilma Elizabeth Scott, Nate Teeter of Sullivan, passed away Wednesday, March 13th at the age of 80. 
Wilma was the office manager here at KTUI Radio from 1966 to 2017. Wilma is survived by her husband Robert, her children Sam and wife Michelle of Sullivan, and Jared Dawson and husband Dave of Bourbon, her brother Ted Teeter, and a sister Vivian Whalen and husband Jerry all of Sullivan. Four grandchildren, ten great-grandchildren, nieces, nephews, great-nieces and nephews, other relatives, and many friends. Services for Wilma Scott have been postponed at this time and will be rescheduled for a later date under the direction of the Eaton Funeral Home and Cremation Center of Sullivan. James H. Jim Monken of Steelville passed away Thursday, March 14th at the age of 79. He is survived by his wife, Delcy Monken of Steelville, daughters Deborah Barnes of Bethel, Illinois, Diane Perry of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Paula Lubert of Meadowbrook, Illinois. Stepchildren, Lori and husband Jeff DePillo, Sierra and husband Donald Campbell, and Bob and wife Tanya Sturbler, all of Illinois. By his sister, Rhonda Monken of St. James, brothers-in-law, John D. Ray and Gerald D. Ray, both of Illinois, sister-in-law, Brenda K. Corbin of Illinois, three grandchildren, special friends, Bob Carollo and Juanita Schuler, both of Sullivan, other relatives, and many friends. Funeral services will be held at 1 p.m. on Tuesday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at the St. James City Cemetery. The service will be live-streamed on Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 12.55 p.m. on Tuesday. Visitation will be held from 10 a.m. until time of service at 1 p.m. Tuesday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. Janice Lorraine Adams of Bland passed away Wednesday, March 13th in Owensville at the age of 82. She is survived by her children, Donald Adams Jr. of St. Louis, Dawn Hanna of Bland, and Cherie Friday and husband Mike of Union, a sister, Kay Voss of Arnold, six grandchildren, 15 great-grandchildren, other relatives, and many friends. A massive Christian burial will be held on Wednesday at 11 a.m. at the Immaculate Conception Catholic Church in Owensville with burial in the church cemetery. Visitation will be held from 9 to 11 a.m. on Wednesday at the Gotten Street Funeral Home in Owensville. Memorials are requested for the family's choice. Barry Ray B.R. White of Steelville passed away at his home on Sunday, March 17th at the age of 70. Barry is survived by his wife, Lavonda Mert White of Steelville, his children, Jason and wife Heather White, Stephanie and husband Dennis Callahan, both of Steelville, siblings Lawrence Butch White and wife Shirley, Donna and husband Rick White, and Debbie Jennings, all of Salem, a sister-in-law, Tanya White of Salem, one grandson, four step-grandchildren, one great-grandson, many nieces, nephews, cousins, and friends. Funeral services for Barry White will be held at 11 a.m. Thursday at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville with burial at Steelville Cemetery. The service will be live-streamed on Hudson Funeral Home and Steelville's Facebook page beginning at 10.55 a.m. Thursday. Visitation will be held from 6 until 8 p.m. Wednesday evening at the Hudson Funeral Home in Steelville. Memorials may be given to Golden Echoes in memory of Barry B.R. White. Funeral announcements on Mondays are brought to you by Healing Stone Monuments in Sullivan. Come join us at our Seidenstruger Nobi Partners Spring Open House April 5th and 6th at our Union dealership and get in the yellow seat. We have event-only specials and you can save big on our John Deere compact tractors. Take advantage of 0% financing for 84 months with zero down. Plus save up to an additional $2,500 on model year 23 compact tractors. Visit SNPartners.com for more information. Offer valid through 4-6-2024. Some restrictions apply. See dealer for details. Good Monday morning, everybody. Here's the latest in sports from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Cardinals picked up a big win in spring training action yesterday, led by a minor leaguer. Here's John Rooney and Mike Claiborne with the Cardinal Recap. With Mike Claiborne, I'm John Rooney. Yesterday, the Cardinals were down by two runs in the eighth inning. It was Jose Fermin with a walk, and then a two-run homer by Luke and Baker tied it up. And then the Cardinals were able to take advantage of some walks, a hit by Michael Ciani, and then to the plate, young Brody Moore. Moore swings, and it's a high fly ball. Hamilton moving back. He's at the track. It's a grand slam for Moore. 10 to 6 Cardinals. Wow, what a finish, Claves. 10 to 6 Cardinals over Houston. It was a great finish, especially for Brody. One home run in 90 games, and uh, I think this will be the one he'll always remember. 
I think so. And Jojo Romero came after batters and put an end to the game, finishing up in the ninth inning, and Andre Pallante got the win. He was very aggressive, Jojo was, and that's something he's got to do in order to be part of this rotation as far as the bullpen's concerned. Our next broadcast comes your way tomorrow. It will be the Cardinals against the Marlins. Kyle Gibson will be on the mound at 11.55 a.m. Thank you very much, John. We'll have that Cardinals game on tomorrow on 102.1 KTUI-FM. Blues picked up a big win last night in back-to-back home games as they downed the Anaheim Ducks. Here's Alex Ferrario from the Blues Radio Network with a Blues recap. Last night, the Blues wrapped up a set of back-to-back games as their homestand continued against the Anaheim Ducks. In the first period, the Ducks would be the first team to score Troy Terry with a rebound right in front of the net. They would exit the first period with a 1-0 lead, but then Kevin Hayes would get the same rebound chance off of a Tory Krug shot to tie things up after two periods. Then the third period, the power play erupted. Three straight power play opportunities and three straight power play goals. Two by Robert Thomas, one by Jake Neighbors to take a 4-1 lead. Anaheim would score one late, but not enough to come back in this one. A 4-2 final score as the Blues pick up their 36th win of the season. Now sit four points behind Vegas for that bottom wild card spot, and they'll take on the Colorado Avalanche to wrap up the homestand on Tuesday. 7 o'clock puck drop, 6.30 pregame skate on the St. Louis Blues radio network. Thank you, Alex. We'll have that Blues game Tuesday night on 102.1 FM. College scoreboard from the weekend, Missouri State women's basketball put together an impressive defensive effort, beating Belmont Saturday evening 63-48 to get to the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament Championship on Sunday. But they saw their regular season come to an end with a layup at the buzzer by Drake's Anna Miller, spoiling a Lady Bear comeback as Drake won at 76-75. The Lady Bears, though, will take on the University of Illinois in the opening round of the inaugural Women's Basketball Invitation Tournament this Thursday in Champaign, Illinois. This marks the inaugural WBIT, which is an annual 32-team postseason invitation tournament for women's basketball that is owned and funded by the NCAA. College baseball, Missouri swept by number one Arkansas of the weekend, losing 6-0 on Saturday, 9-1 on Sunday. Kansas State took a 12-6 come from behind victory over Missouri State on Saturday and finished off the sweep with an 11-3 victory over the Bears on Sunday. Four players homeward as number three Central Missouri won its 11th consecutive game on Saturday, cruising to a 16-4 seven-inning win over Washburn. Washburn came back on Sunday with a three-run homer in the bottom of the eighth to win the series finale 10-9. College of the Ozarks split a doubleheader with Mission University on Saturday, grabbing the first game 7-2, falling 5-3 in the second game. Trey Riley of St. James was 0-3 in each game for College of the Ozarks. Columbia College rolled to a doubleheader win over Harris Stowe on Saturday, taking down the Hornets 24-1 and 16-2. Chase McCaig from Herman was 0-2 with a run scored on Saturday. Cougars then finished off the sweep, taking Harris Stowe 19-2 on Sunday, and McCaig went 0-1. ECC Baseball swept a series with North Arkansas College over the weekend, winning 7-3 and 9-8 with a walk-off two-run homer on Saturday and then 14-11 on Sunday. Mason Snyder from Pacific pitched in relief in Game 1 Saturday. Anthony Broker from St. Clair earned the win, going three and a third innings to pick up the win in the second game on Saturday. Emporia State fell to Rogers State 6-4 on Saturday afternoon. T.J. Rockerbomber from Herman 1-4 with a walk and a run scored for Emporia. The Hornets then outlasted Rogers State in a pitcher's duel 1-0 Sunday afternoon to take the series two games to one. Rockerbomber was 0-2. Hannibal LaGrange fell twice at Missouri Baptist on Saturday 9-3 and 21-6. Isaiah Helsher from Union was 2-5 with two walks and an RBI on the day for Hannibal LaGrange. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader for Mineral Area, 5-3 and 10-0 on Saturday. Sam Pauley from Washington, 0 for 4 with two walks and a run on the day for State Fair. Missouri S&T split a doubleheader with Drury on Saturday, taking the first game 11-5, losing the second game 14-2. Tommy Reether from Washington, 1 for 5 with a walk on the day Saturday. Myers finished with a series split after winning 8-9-1 on Sunday. St. Louis Community College lost twice at home on Saturday to Crowder, 9-4 and 12-1. The Archers then went on the road to Crowder on Sunday, losing 10-0 and 11-4.
Missouri St. Louis swept Lewis University 9-6 and 11-9 in a doubleheader on Saturday afternoon. Trent Anderson from Herman pitched the final two innings, giving up no runs on a hit and two strikeouts and two walks to earn his second save of the year in that second game. The Tritons won the series finale 9-5 on Sunday. In softball, number 11 Missouri dropped their Saturday matinee against number 8 Tennessee 8-2. Tennessee pitching continued to dominate on Sunday as they finished off a sweep of Missouri in a 4-0 victory. Visiting Illinois State turned back Missouri State 7-2 on Saturday at Killian Stadium. Kayla Ulrich from Sullivan got the start at first base for the Lady Bears and went 3-4 for four with her first collegiate home run, a two-run shot in the bottom of the seventh. Missouri State then pounded out a season high 13 hits and got a six-inning home run from Annie Mueller to seal the deal in a 7-4 win over Illinois State on Sunday. Ulrich was 3-4 for four with an RBI in that game. Evangel Softball took both ends of a doubleheader with Bethany College on Saturday, 10-1 and 1-0. Naomi Perkins from Steelville, 1 for 5 with a run and an RBI on the day for Evangel. Fonbon Softball dropped both games in a doubleheader with Rose Holman, 6-5 and 8 innings and 8-5 on Saturday. Madeline Holtmeyer from Washington, 0 for 2 in Game 1. They lost the home doubleheader with Dubuque on Sunday, 10-7 and 7-2. Jefferson College lost a pair of nail biters to St. Charles Community College on Saturday, falling 1-0 in nine innings and then losing 2-0 in the second game. On Sunday, the Vikings won a doubleheader for Metropolitan Community College in Kansas City by scores of 15-2 and 19-4. Sophia Wyrick from Sullivan, 0-2 for in the first game with St. Charles Saturday, 0-4 for in the first game against Metropolitan on Sunday. Kansas got a two-run single in the fourth inning and turned three double plays and two nothing win against number 13 Baylor on Saturday. Addison Purvis from Sullivan was 0 for 1 with a walk as DH for the Jayhawks. They finished off the sweep with a one nothing victory on Sunday as Purvis drew another walk as a pinch hitter. Lindenwood softball dropping two close games at Tennessee State on Saturday, falling 2-1 and 5-4 in eight innings. Lions dropped their final game at Tennessee State 6-3 on Sunday. Hannah Johanning scored a run as a pinch runner in that game on Sunday. MSU West Plains split with three rivers on the road Saturday, losing 1-0 and pitching a 4-0 shutout in Game 2. They won both games with Lyon College on Sunday, 6-0 and 12-4. Alexis Funkhauser from Sullivan was 1-6 for six with two RBI against three rivers, 3-6 three for six with an RBI and a run versus Lyon. Rockhurst softball lost a home doubleheader to McHenry University, 4-3 in eight innings and then 7-1 on Saturday. Emma Vodnanski from Washington 0-4 for four on the day for Rockhurst. They split a doubleheader with Umsel on Sunday, losing 8-5, winning 3-0. Vodnanski was 0-2. for two. State Fair Community College won a doubleheader at Metropolitan, 7-4 and 3-0 on Saturday. Myla Inman from Washington won for 5 with a run and 2 RBI on the day. The Roadrunners then dropped a home doubleheader with Crowder on Sunday, 13-1 and 15-8. UHSP split with Westminster College on Saturday, 10-1 win in the first game, 4-2 loss in the second. Hannah Duggan from Pacific played right field in both games, was 0-2 at the plate in Game 2. University of Health Sciences and Pharmacy also split with Culver Stockton on Sunday, winning the first game 9-2, dropping the nightcap 8-0. Congratulations going out to Ryan Herman from St. Clair, who placed 7th at 285 pounds to close out the 2024 NCAA Division II Wrestling National Championships in Park City, Kansas over the weekend, wrestling for Maryville University. In outdoor track at the CMU Open on Saturday on the women's side, Madison Dixon from Herman, running for William Woods, was 12th in the 100-meter dash. Sailor Richardson from Owensville and William Woods was 14th. In the 200 meters, Richardson was 12th and Dixon was 19th. In the triple jump, Lauren Davis of Steelville and Evangel University was 5th. In the shot put, Kaylin Powers from Herman and Hannibal LaGrange was 2nd. Molly Pritchard from Pacific and State Fair Community College was 5th. Powers was 4th in the discus and Pritchard was 15th. Powers was 5th in the hammer throw. College schedule for today, East Central Softball will be at Culver Stockton to take on their JV in a doubleheader at 2 o'clock. In college golf, the Umsel men will be at the Oak Tree Invitational, William Woods Women in the State Fair Community College Invitational in Sedalia today. Congratulations going out to Herman High School senior Jill Rood on signing to play volleyball at Jefferson College in Hillsboro next year. Looking at the scoreboard from the local sports over the weekend, the Four Rivers Baseball Tournament Games at Union on Saturday. It was Sullivan getting by Pacific 4-2 in a great game, and St. Clair lost to Union 15-0. At Owensville, St. James defeated New Haven 6-1, Owensville over Herman by a score of 5-1.
at the Troy Classic. Washington losing twice, falling to Timberland 9-4 and Parkway West 8-1. Other games, Borgia defeated Wright City 11-3 in varsity, 21-0 in JV. Cuba baseball was in a round robin at Salem on Saturday. They fell to Salem 10-0 and lost to Vienna 11-8. At the Windsor JV tournament, Valley beat Pacific 8-4, Windsor over Pacific 12-1. Girls soccer at the Warrenton Soccer Classic. Washington defeated the host school 8-0. Sullivan over the St. Louis Patriots 2-0. Washington beats St. Clair 3-2, Sullivan over Ellsbury 3-2, and St. Clair beats St. Louis Christian, the Patriots, by a score of 3-0. At the Rolla Tournament on Saturday, it was Pacific over Rolla 5-2, Springfield Catholic beat Borgia 3-0, Pacific and Springfield Catholic played a 0-0 tie, and Rolla over Borgia 3-2. Middle school volleyball at the Bland 8th grade tournament. Herman taking first place, beating Bland in two sets. Eugene was third as they down Chamoy. At the St. James 8th grade tournament, Hawkins Junior High out of Jackson beats St. Clair in two sets for the championship. Salem over St. James in two sets for third place. Looking at the local schedule for today, high school baseball, Bell and Bourbon are playing in the Stoutland tournament this week. Bell opens up today at 5 o'clock against Lakeway at Tiger Field. Bourbon will not play until Tuesday. They'll take on Dixon at 4 o'clock on Tuesday and then Stoutland at 6 o'clock in the pool play part of that tournament. The Four Rivers Conference Tournament will wrap up on Wednesday. Games to be played at Sullivan at 4 o'clock. It'll be St. James and Owensville for consolation. Sullivan and Union for the championship at 6. Games at St. Clair on Wednesday. New Haven and Herman at 4 o'clock for 7th place. Pacific and St. Clair for 3rd place. Washington is uh, in pool play today at the Troy Classic. They'll take on Hannibal at 4.30 today at Troy. At the Windsor JV Baseball Tournament today, DeSoto takes on Pacific at 6 o'clock. Girls soccer coming up today. Sullivan begins play in the Lutheran St. Charles Tournament as they will take on University City at 6.15. They'll have a game on Tuesday against Northwest and Thursday against Lutheran St. Charles. Other games today, Owensville at Pacific, Varsity only at 5. St. James at Eugene, Varsity only at 5. Union at St. Clair, Varsity then JV at 5 o'clock this evening. High school track today, Sullivan hosting an early season quad meet with Bourbon, St. Clair, and Union. That will get underway at 3 o'clock with the field events, running events at 4. Middle school track today, Bland will be at Lynn, and that meet starts at 3.30. High school golf today, Bell and Owensville order a match at Cuba Lakes Classic at 4 o'clock. Borge and Union in the Father Tolton Invitational Tournament at 10 this morning. Potosi at St. James for a dual meet at 4 this afternoon. Middle school volleyball coming up tonight. Bland will be at New Haven at 5.30. Eugene at Owensville at 5 o'clock. That's your look at sports on this Monday from the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. Have a great day, everybody. This is Bobby D. Do you have a guy? Like your dad or grandpa had a guy. Something broke around the house you couldn't fix, Gramps would say, call my guy. He probably drove an old blue pickup, big tool chest in the back, decades of calluses on strong hands, name on his shirt like Don or Ed or Buddy. He just always seemed to know the best way to fix any problem. That's why grandpa trusted him. There's not many of those guys around today, and no wonder. Between taxes and technology, insurance and licensing, it's hard to be that guy and be competitive. Well, that's why this company started. We love what we do, and we still want to be that guy. Independent technicians, generations of combined experience, all joined together as one powerful team. Strength in numbers, you know? If you're ever stuck with a broken furnace or air conditioner, now you've got a guy. We're level nine, heating and cooling. Level nine, HVAC.com. And we have uh, 22 minutes away from the hour of nine o'clock. It is uh, sunny, 29 here at the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. 25 degrees now out at the Sullivan Regional Airport. And uh, happy birthday today. And Carol, K. Bilo, Sally Salings. Gilberta Record, all having birthdays today. Happy birthday to them. No anniversaries. And let me see here. Make sure I've got get everything all situated. And uh, there we go. I think that's going to work. 
All right, sitting across from me is Corporal Dallas Thompson from the Missouri State Highway Patrol. Good morning, sir. Happy Monday morning to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As most people know, it's, it's, it's been a weekend. Yes, it, it really like has it. with uh, uh, Sam and his medical situation, and we've got uh, a bunch of other stuff that's going on, everything uh, operating in threes. So uh, we're, we're bullying our way through and uh, just uh, hope for the best and uh, uh, keep Sam and the family in prayers as well Absolutely. as he Absolutely. recovers uh, from uh, is working on recovery from his stroke and of course uh, if you didn't hear his uh, his mom's visitation has been uh, postponed until a later date until Sam's able to be at the service so uh, that was scheduled for tomorrow afternoon and evening so uh, that has been pushed back and as soon as uh, as soon as we get something definite we'll we'll be sure and pass that along all right first thing I wanted to talk about seat belts mm-hmm we talk about that a lot. Yes. You see signs everywhere. It's taught. Uh, it's encouraged, and still, people don't do it. Correct. You know, uh, you know, the studies have been shown uh, across the across the state that Missouri actually has about a 90% seatbelt usage. Uh, you never hear that number. You think no, because too many people are dying and they're unbuckled. Well, that's that's true. You know, about 65% of all fatalities are unbuckled. But uh, as a whole, um, we have a pretty good percentage of seatbelt usage rates. And I think that comes from, you know, a lot of our younger uh, people now kind of growed up mm-hmm. with that just being, you know, that's what you do. You get yep. in the seat and you put your seatbelt on and you take off. You know, a lot of us that are a little bit older, you know, late 40s and 50s and older, they didn't really grow up with having to wear that seatbelt. It wasn't the law then. So it's taking a little time for them to catch on. Um, but a lot of those that did catch on, just they taught their kids. Now those kids are teaching their kids. That's just the way it's supposed to be. So we do have a better percentage. But, yeah, the people that are dying on our roadway, about 65% each year are unbuckled. I was really surprised it's not higher than 65%. Because I know, you know, we, we get the death notices all the time here from the patrol, the, the patrol reports. And it just, it seems to me, at least the ones that we, that we go over, uh, that I can think back and remember, uh, the vast majority of them, you see a fatality, it's uh, somebody ejected or right. thrown out a wind, you know, a rollover accident. And, and they were ejected because they were wearing their seatbelts. I know there was... I had one that I, I didn't have on the air that I was looking at this morning down Perry County. A couple of trucks collided. Neither right. one had their seatbelt on. Right. And do you find that a lot of times people that are buckling up are in pickups? Um, you know, it varies. It varies. I'd have to look at the numbers to see what the percentage of or, or for pickups and SUVs and, and passenger vehicles. But it kind of varies, so I, I really can't answer that okay. to, to know for sure. Yeah, that's I. I just I had something that I kind of noticed a little bit because I drive a pickup, right? Uh, and uh, you know, and and I'm guilty of this. If I'm making a, a little short errand run in town, just jump. In a lot go. of times I don't. Right. You know, I I I kind of I have it figured that my um, seatbelt not buckled indicator beeper is going to go off twice get annoying enough before to on. <laughs> between when i between the time i leave the house until i get where i'm going and then sometimes i can get it once on the way back it depends uh you know it's like okay i can put up with it you know you know and, for that and, short piece of, and period a lot of time. people feel that yeah. same way yeah you know, i'm just going across town i'm only going to be doing 25 miles per hour yeah. i'm not going i'm not going any high speeds I mean, but you don't have to be at high speeds no. you know uh, i tell the story in a lot of our high schools i think one of the lowest uh, recorded fatalities is about 14 miles per hour and that was a lady that was not paying attention she rear-ended a vehicle at a stoplight and she wasn't wearing her seat belt she didn't yep. have airbags or anything in the older car went forward hit her chest on the steering wheel um, you know, police got there, EMS got there, checked her out. She said she was fine, uh, went home, and she'd actually cracked a rib, and she'd uh, you know, lacerated one of her internal organs. She laid down, took a nap, and never woke up. Yeah. She was bleeding out internally. So you don't have to be going those high speeds. You know, that seat belt keeps you back in that seat. Even low speeds, you get thrown forward. You know, even if you're just sitting at a stoplight, um, parked at a stoplight or just stopped at a stoplight and you get it from behind, that's a pretty heavy force that's going to push you forward and you can hit the steering wheel or you know hit your head on the dash or something like that. So that seat belt's designed to keep you there in that seat and uh, you know eliminate a lot of those injuries. And, and you know, there are uh, people I think also need may not realize this, but a lot of times it depends, I guess, on the vehicle or the year uh, model of the vehicle. Uh, if you're hit from the rear, a lot of times, unless you have the side curtain airbags, they your your front airbags don't go off. Correct. Correct. 
correct. If you're hit from the rear, because that happened to uh, me and my oldest daughter. Uh, we were rear-ended uh, a little over a year ago. Right. And no airbags. Right. Those sensors you know. are in the front bumper there. Yeah. And if they don't get hit, they don't go off. Yeah. So. And so uh, now I think some some vehicles that have the side curtain airbags, if you are hit from the rear, those will go off. On a lot of them, yes. But the, the front airbags the front still normally, don't go off, yeah, uh, even if you're hitting it, you know. So right. uh, please be aware of that. That's another great and, reason. And also remember that those airbags, airbags work in conjunction with the seatbelt. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have that seatbelt on, don't think I'm okay because I got airbags. That yeah. airbag comes out about 220 miles per hour. Yeah, if that hits you in the face, it's going to hurt pretty bad. Yeah. And so You can get some severe. I've, I've seen instances where people have had pretty severe injuries right. so they work wonderful yeah. together yeah uh, but one doesn't work as well independently yeah. without the other all right so now that we've we've, we've gone over that topic uh, uh what's uh, are some other things that you want to talk about today well you know like i said we just talked about the, the temperature this morning you know we all think and we're towards the end of, of winter but we still got some time we're gonna get these freezing temperatures so people need to, to remember that and uh you know hopefully we don't see any more snow but you know, history has told us or has told us that uh you know, there's still a chance we might get a little you know, shot of snow between here and, and spring. Yep. So don't forget that. So don't get rid of those emergency kits that you have in your vehicles just yet. Um, better to have and not need than to need and not have. So yeah. keep a hold of that and uh, just be prepared for a couple more weeks, hopefully, then we can get through this cold spell and get into some warmer weather. Hey, you know, and, uh, you know, I can, I can remember, um, I don't know if this just shows that I'm old or if I've got a good memory or what, but I can remember snow middle of April. Oh, yes. Uh, a cold front coming through and, and, and getting a measurable, uh, pretty good little snow in the middle of April before. So, Thankfully, uh, it doesn't stick around long. No, it usually it's, it's, doesn't. I think it warmed up quite a bit uh, <clears throat> later on the day. It just it just came through, quick shot. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't here very long. It wasn't a long-standing thing. But, you know, hey, it, uh, it was here for a while, and uh, that can make a huge, uh, you know, dent in the, Absolutely. In the driving situations. and. Also, you know, with these cold temperatures, um, frost still on the windshield. Correct. In the morning. Correct. You I know. had some this morning. Yeah, um, you got to watch out for that. And so many people, and I learned a long time ago, and then my dad was a big advocate of this. You don't move until that windshield clear. is cleared. Yes. Now, whether it's sitting there in your car waiting for the defroster to work. Or you getting out in the cold with a scraper <laughs> uh, scraping out in more than just a little bitty hole here exactly. to where you can lean forward and see exactly. the front of your car. We, we see that quite often. Oh, yeah. Uh, even uh, still today. With, yes. Even or with the, the remote start you know, vehicles. About every vehicle has them now. Yeah. You know, you can remote start that from inside the house and give it five, six minutes, and your windshield's probably going to be pretty well clear. But, yeah, we still see lots of these newer vehicles that just got a little scrape hole there people can barely see out of yeah. and yeah. Uh, the, and i know we're all in hurries and we got to get to places but you got to prepare and plan for your morning and and be ready to be safe yeah and my thing is the side you know your your side right. windows in the front people never you know clear those clear out those. oh arr, i got this little i got this you know hole yeah. here in the front i can see i can see in front of me and that's all i need to worry yeah. about uh, Unfortunately, and, yeah. we do see that, and it's, it's not safe at all. No, uh, it's so. not. Uh, I, I I even know somebody that did that. Well, they were running late, and I just scraped the front, you know, and didn't do the side window. Well, you couldn't see the rearview mirror, right? And they they pulled out from the front of their house, absolutely. And there was a car mm -hmm. coming around the, the the corner and pulled right out, and yep. you know, their fault. And, yep, and it was. Yep. Um, and so, uh, you know, he was like, oh, yeah, he said, I couldn't believe I was that stupid. I'm like, oh, yeah. It, At least he uh, recognized it after the fact. Yeah, he did. You know, and luckily, <laughs> you know, luckily he, he did have his seatbelt on and he wasn't, uh, neither driver was seriously hurt. But, you know, both vehicles were, were messed up. But and, that's a good story. That could have been a different outcome. Oh, yeah. You know, very the car well, could have been coming well a little could've, faster. Yeah. It could have hit him right in the, in the driver's door. Yeah. You know, it could have hurt him or whoever that, yeah. hit, you know, got hit by. It could have been hurt mm -hmm. very seriously. All right, so uh, what, now this uh, time of year, we, we talked about weather. Uh, with things getting a little warmer, uh, we've got more sunshine later in the day now mm -hmm. with the change in the time. Right. Uh, kids after school, riding bikes, being yes. outside playing, those sort of things. Um, again, that's you got to watch out for them. Yes, you know. Uh, distracted driving is the second leading cause of traffic crashes in Missouri and, and the second leading cause of fatalities in Missouri. And, you know, 
every every month seems like I come in here we're talking about how many pedestrians have mm -hmm. been hit especially the last year or two it seems like we're just constantly having pedestrians hit and a lot of those is just because the people are inattentive and you know whether it's the cell phone or, or adjusting the navigation or adjusting the controls or whatever um, there's just so many people that are distracted on our roadways. You know, just get out here on the interstate and drive towards St. Louis, and you're going to get passed by a dozen vehicles where the driver is going to pass you, and you can look over at them. And they're staring down at their cell phone. Yeah. You know, they may be. You might be able to see the type, and they may be scrolling. You can see their fingers scrolling that screen, or they're looking at Facebook or whatever. You know, it's mindless scrolling. We get it. And driving can be boring, but you have to pay attention to the road ahead. You know, things can happen so quickly in front of you. You know, tractor trailer slams on the brakes for a hazard ahead, and you don't see it. Next thing you know, you you know right into the rear of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, like I say, with the longer days and the kids going to be out, you know, in their neighborhoods and and uh, crossing streets, riding bikes. Now more than ever is the time to eliminate all those distractions. Yeah. Well, I you know, and I see it more in town uh, driving. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I still I see it because I'm out on the interstate a lot, and, and like you said, I I see people, you know, out all the time. Either uh, you know. They're they're driving 60 miles an hour in the driving lane because they're on their phone and right. and all this, so they just instinctively slow down. And so, you know, you move out to pass them, and you happen to look over, and they're you see they're, they're doing, doing this right. number. And and then the next thing you know, three miles down the road, they're zipping past you at 85 miles an hour because they're trying yes. to make up for the time they lost when they slowed right. down on their phone. Right. And so, you know, it's a it's a it's a double-edged sword i guess if you want to put it that way doubly dangerous so you know people uh, don't think it's yeah. a big deal until it's a big deal yeah you know it's like you know I, I do it i know i do it i need to stop it but whenever you know someone that's been killed in a crash because of a distracted driver you know those people that do it are also the people that are offended or getting mad because their friend or family member was just killed by someone that was distracted oh yeah so we've all got to think you know we can stop this. This is a, a crash that does not need to happen or did not need to happen. Yep. And we can eliminate all those crashes. Yeah. So uh, put the phones down or if you have a passenger with you, have them. Yeah, I thought they answered that you know, text let, message let, or phone yeah, call. There you go. You know, I'm not yeah. even a huge fan of the new hands-free things. You know, the yeah. Apple Car Plays. That's still a distraction. Yeah. You know, your your mind is focusing on that phone call and, and what discussions you're having there and not paying attention to the road ahead. Yeah. We can always get wrapped up in what's going on on the telephone and be thinking about things and not be looking ahead. Yeah. And you might think you are, but your mind's not thinking of. Well, yeah. Driving. You know, and and you have to. Unless you get to the point you've had it for long enough and you get to the point where you know where the various buttons are right. on your controls on the steering wheel, a lot of people still have to look down and make sure their thumb is pressing, you know, phone call exactly. on the hands-free. you got to look down and make sure your thumb is pressing the, the receive right button. call button right. and not the hang-up button, <laughs> exactly. you know, or you're, you know, you're changing your volume or something on the right. control on the back side of it. And, uh, yeah, so it's not... Uh, not 100 percent no absolutely not. hands free and it's not 100 uh, percent focus free that, that's the either big thing. focus yeah. free yeah that's still free. a distraction yeah so uh, that's something to, to keep an eye on and uh, you know make sure that when you get out there on the road that uh, you're paying attention because one of the things you know i see is that driving down the interstate a lot is tractor trailers making sudden lane changes right most of them i will say try to signal they just may not give you a lot of warning. I agree with that. Uh, uh, when they do, I mean, it's just like as they're moving over to the other lane, they're their hand signal. happens to hit the signal <laughs> button, button, which I'm not saying they're the only ones that do that. No. Uh, drivers in other vehicles are the same way or, or don't signal at all. Uh, but, you know, they'll be coming uh, up on a slower moving tractor trailer or something. You're right. You're right. And uh, rather than them hitting the brakes or downshifting or whatever, it's you yes. know they're they're moving over and they'll they'll let you know after the fact uh so um, <laughs> you're correct uh, there you know uh so that's something that i'm always trying to keep myself aware of right uh because you know there's there's just so many uh trucks on the road through our area and uh, even in the early morning when I'm coming into work, most of the traffic is trucks. Right. And right. and you they're not all backed up, you know, like you see it during the day. But, you know, there's still you'll have times when there will be a small group of them right. that you'll come up on. So, you know, I even try to make sure I watch out for it in the mornings uh, yes. when I'm early or, or later at night when I'm coming home from a game. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing I know that a lot of times that I have to really make sure I'm – keeping an eye on we 
probably, you know, always taught our kids you have to drive for the other people on the roadway. So yep. Drive your vehicles, but you also have to drive for them. Be a defensive driver yep. and constantly be paying attention and watching out for the their movements. You might yep. be a safe driver. You might be doing everything right, but we know there's so many people out here that's not. So we have to drive for them as well. Yeah, the old yeah the old defensive driving. I remember that from my driver's ed class. Right. Uh, Mr. McCann, Mr. Garver uh, would be very pleased that I still remember that, although they <laughs> have both passed. But, uh, but uh, yeah, that's you know, watch out for the other guy was the old, uh, you know, old added, ad yeah. campaign for a long time, and right. you know, uh, I think that's been updated. Watch out for the other crazies on the road, but uh, you know, that, that's not always the case. But uh, so you know, again. Uh, Keep your eyes out of the phone. Keep your brains out of the phone. And, Absolutely. Uh, I've always taught. I always taught my kids to. Um, I always like to compare it, and I don't remember who made this analogy for me a long time ago, but just imagine you're playing like chess or checkers, and one of the keys to the game is always looking ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, planning two or three moves yeah, ahead yeah, in right. the game, and then moving accordingly to set up for that. I always try to teach my kids that that's how you have to drive be thinking of what be you going know on. Right. uh i always especially around here rural areas you know any time of year deer absolutely you know and i'm you know i'm driving you know curvy back roads right through the middle of deer country nine months out of the year yep. uh so uh you know i'm always making sure i've got looking my ahead, eyes scanning scanning ahead yes. you know looking at the edge of the, the the tree lines and the ditches and the fences and right and looking ahead around the curbs and, and stuff like that and um you're not know. driving too fast on roads that you know or yeah to have lots of deer yeah you know when you see the uh the uh, the signs uh, and the little arrows on the sharp curves and it says 30 miles an hour and you're like oh i can take her faster than that and you can and, but that's yeah, the but safe speed to yeah do it. yeah until you get in there trying to drive it at 50 and you're going you right. know so uh you're like oh yeah maybe i should have maybe i should have cooled it down a little bit exactly. so uh and you know so it, it just uh, be aware of your surroundings that's yep, just that's yeah. right okay that's right uh, anything else that you want to share with us you know, pass along? Well, we're talking about a little warmer where they're coming uh you know about time for boating season. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so people, now's the time to get those boats out, start going through them, making sure they're running right, uh, make sure you have all the equipment that you need. If you're not sure what equipment you need in it, you can always reach out to the patrol and have one of our water patrol troopers uh, give you a call, kind of ex you know, explain to you what uh, stuff you need. They probably give you a list of things. Um, you know, if you want to have one of them inspect your vehicle or your boat, just yeah. to look at it, make sure you've got everything that you need, you know. Feel free to call them up. They'll probably meet up with you somewhere and take a look at your boat. And make sure you got all the equipment that you need, and and that way there's no questions when you get out on the lakes or the rivers. That, uh, but now's the time to be preparing that you don't want to be out on the lake and or on the river out here and get stopped by one of those guys and you don't have what you need. Yeah. Now, um, are boats like cars? Do you have to have a license? If you're born after January 1st, 1984, you have to have an operator's okay. boating. It's not a boating license, but it's, uh, you've had to have like a hunter safety course. You have a boater safety course. Okay. Yeah, so there's a card you have to have with okay. that. And so, yeah, if you're born after 84, you have to have a boater safety course that you have okay. to pass. And it's probably a good idea for those even born before 84. Well, it's just good information yeah. to have, yeah. again, with the equipment that you need and just basic boater operations of the yeah. boat itself. You know, a lot of those are online courses now, but we do do some. That's actually in-person courses. Um, so it's no, it's it's just good information to have. It's kind of like concealed carry. Yeah. You know, you don't have to have concealed carry law a license anymore, but it's good information to have, uh, good training to have. Yeah. So it's just it's just the more you can arm yourself, the better you are as yeah. far as knowledge. Now, like cars have license plates. Do do boats have to have like a registration number or something? Right. You know, the trailer's the going to have the trailer. license plates okay. already, uh, but the side of the boat's going to have the MO and then the registration number that's assigned to that boat. Okay. And then there's a sticker on there that you renew those every so often as well. Okay. So, so uh, you need to make sure those are up to date. Make sure those are up to date. Uh, and and speaking of license plates and and stickers, I know there are some counties and municipalities that are trying to crack down on the expired temp tags. Yes. Uh, uh, is that something the highway patrol oh, is absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. you know that's something we constantly watch for and and it's an easy violation to spot um, but you know depending on where you're working at it's it's a uh, violation that's prominent i mean it's there's so many of them so we can only stop so many at a time so but yeah it, it's a it's a problem you know and and people are getting these 30-day temp tags 60-day temp tags and just 
letting them run for months afterwards. Oh, I uh, saw one uh, the other day that was a year and a half. Right, you know, and we see those yeah. too. And you know, we stop those and we'll, we'll write the ticket for that. And a couple weeks later, you see it again. Uh, you know, I guess the people just don't have the money to pay the sales tax and get it licensed. But you know, yeah. I had to do it for my vehicle, so you need to do it for yours well, as well. Yeah, I, you yeah. know, that's that's the way I feel about it. Anyway, insurance. Was, we have I, to have insurance yes. on our vehicles, so and you got to have a license. Yeah, to driver's do license that. to do that. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, Corporal Thompson, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Corporal Dallas Thompson, Missouri State Highway Patrol, has been my guest today from uh, Troop C out of St. Louis, and uh, look forward to your visits every month. We'll talk thank to you, you later. We appreciate All right. it. All right. We are coming up on 9 o'clock, uh, about a minute away from that. I want to tell you about uh, uh, the great guys at Mid-State Paving. Give, uh, give Jim a call. Uh, they're looking at 760, 7653 Hardicky Road. Uh, they do paving and chip sealing. Uh, they do striping, seal coating, uh, site work, drainage work, septic services, grading, lake dredging, and repair. Now they'll do demolition for streets, parking lots, driveways, and a whole lot more. Uh, give Jim a call, 573-627-2039. That's uh, 573-627-2039 uh, for Jim and Mid-State Paving. For all of your paving, site work, uh, septic drainage needs, uh, they do it all at Mid-State Paving. Coming up on 9 o'clock, uh, we'll have news and then the for sale show. We're scheduled to have some guests from the Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital. April McDonald and Rachel Saltzman are uh, registered dietitians. This is National Nutrition Month, and hopefully we'll be able to get them on and get to be talking with them about that. This is KTUI 1560 AM Sullivan, Missouri, the Sullivan Bank Studios of KTUI Radio. It's 9 o'clock. Here's the news. I'm Ryan Daniels. Early results from Russia's presidential election show President Vladimir Putin winning with 88% of the vote. His victory was all but guaranteed with no real challengers to his re-election. At the same time, Putin is claiming that he had agreed to a prisoner swap involving imprisoned Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny before he died. On Sunday, Putin was asked by NBC News. Putin said that he had agreed on the condition Navalny never returned to Russia. But unfortunately, Navalny died before the exchange could take place. Many in the West have accused Putin of assassinating Navalny. Former President Trump is explaining why he threatened during a political rally to allow Russia to attack NATO member nations if he's re-elected. When I said that and when I made that statement, I want to energize them to pay. During a weekend interview with Fox News, Trump has pushed for years to change the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was founded on the promise that U.S. military might and money would be devoted to protecting European security after World War II. Trump argues that European NATO member nations must commit more financial resources toward their own protection now because they should now be able to afford it. North Korea is firing more missiles over the sea. South Korea's military says a missile was fired early Monday local time. The missile test coincided with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's visit to South Korea. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby says the Biden administration is not backing off its support of Israel or Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He tells Fox News Sunday President Biden only wants to do everything possible to protect innocent lives in Gaza. What we said is we will not support, cannot support, an operation in Rafah that doesn't have an executable, verifiable, achievable plan to take care of the 1.5 million people that are trying to find refuge in Rafah. This is USA News. Hey, here's a question. After you wear your clothes, you toss them in the washing machine, right? Nobody wants to wear dirty clothes. So how come you don't throw your shoes in the washing machine when they get dirty? I mean, come on. Your shoes are touching the filthy ground all day long. Gross. Well, with Skechers, you can. Because most Skechers are machine washable. That's right. Skechers are specially made so you can toss them right in the washing machine and keep them clean and looking new. And when they look new, you can confidently wear them longer. That's less shoes you're going to want to throw away, which means less waste. And it'll save you tons of dough. I love that. Plus, machine washable Skechers are for the whole family, men, women, and kids. So when your kids get their shoes dirty, oh, and we know they will, just wash them. Brilliant. And even our latest technology. New hands-free Skechers slip-ins are washable. You just step right in and go without bending down or even touching your shoes. So give your Skechers the same treatment you give your clothes. Just toss them in the washing machine and keep them looking brand spanking new. Find machine washable Skechers at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, or wherever stylish footwear happens to be sold. 
Former President Trump says he warned Russian President Vladimir Putin not to invade Ukraine. He made that comment while speaking with Fox News over the weekend, also claiming Russia never would have invaded had he been re-elected president in 2020. I would have negotiated a deal. I don't even know if I would have had to negotiate. They never would have attacked while I was president. Ukraine's running out of ammunition and resources in the battle as U.S. aid has hit a roadblock in Congress. Meanwhile, the world learned of Putin's recent re-election to the top office in Russia, meaning the conflict with Ukraine will continue. Now everyone is happy when they are the subject of a Netflix documentary, USA's John Schaefer explains. A father and son are suing Netflix for significant damages due to their portrayal in a documentary about the nationwide college admission scandal. John Wilson Sr. and Jr. filed the lawsuit last week claiming that Netflix unfairly associated them with others convicted of conspiracy and fraud for college admissions. While John Wilson Sr. had his conviction overturned on appeal, he argues that the 2021 film has still tarnished the reputations despite his innocence being proven. Current leaders at the West Point Military Academy believe duty, honor, country is more of a motto than a mission statement, so they are making a change. From now on, the West Point mission statement will read simply Army Values. It's a noted effort toward more inclusivity. I'm Ryan Daniels, USA News. Hi, I'm Ronnie Deutsch, and if you or your business owe money to the IRS, I've got great news for you. Tax laws have changed. Billions of dollars are earmarked for IRS Fresh Start programs. And if you qualify, you can literally save tens of thousands of dollars. Listen, I know what you're going through. Call me if you want to speak with a tax attorney or tax professional for free. 800-284-9275. That's 800-284-9275. For the KTUI Weather Bug Weather Center, for this morning we'll have a clear sky. It'll be Sunday today with a high of 42. A clear night tonight, low 24. Tuesday, sunny, high 68. Clear Tuesday night, the low 36. Wednesday is going to be a sunny day, high 62. Thursday, partly sunny, can't rule out a shower, the high 56. Friday, partly sunny with a stray shower, high 60. Sunshine, can't rule out a shower Saturday. For KTUI, I'm meteorologist Jim Rinaldi. All right, thank you very much, Jim. And it is currently 29 degrees here at Studios of KTUI. And it is, uh, let's see, I think uh, about six, coming up on six minutes past the hour. And uh, somehow or another, I lost my pen. There it is. All right, I do want to let folks know uh, that with our current situation, we're more than just a little shorthanded. And uh, we're not going to take calls for the for sale show for today, at least. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to change that. And um, oh, let's see here. I'm trying to. I'm also trying to get uh, something uh, lined up here for a Zoom meeting. I'm supposed to be having some folks from the hospital on, but. Uh, They've, uh, we got an update on Zoom and it's changed and I'm trying to figure that out. So uh, bear with me on that. Here's what I do have on my list. Uh, one, I uh, just want to pass along. Now you can get your for sale show items to us in a number of different ways. You can send me a text uh, here at KTUI. Our text number is 573-677-1001. Uh, so you can, uh, again, you can, you can do that, uh, send me that text and, uh, I'll print it out and put it on the, uh, for sale show and we'll, we'll run that on here, uh, for a number of days. And, uh, that's, uh, probably, uh, Sam and I'm, uh, just want to let, uh, Okay, I'm trying to get here, see if I've got any new uh, text messages. Uh, All right, so uh, we've got, trying to see here what I've got as far as the latest uh, information. Oh, um, let's see, that's an older one. 
and uh, all right so that's okay so uh, the latest I have uh, we have uh, folks here said they have two Cracker Barrel wooden rockers that are like new $65 each or two for $120 the number to call there is 573-468-8756 it's 573 468 eight seven five six for those cracker barrel wooden rockers like new sixty five dollars each two four hundred twenty dollars there's a uh, folks have a three quarter inch black and decker drill a black and decker seven and a half a uh, seven and a quarter inch circular saw uh, you can get both of those for twenty five bucks pretty good deal there six three six two three four six two one three six three six Two three four six two one three is the number to call. Uh, some folks are looking to buy a 4K video camera. It does need to be audio capable. If you have one uh, that you'd be willing to part with to help these folks out, 573-205-0328, 205-0328. A recumbent Nordic track machine, $150. 636 484 or 485-5824. 636-485-5824. Um, a three-quarter ton Chevy Extended Cab pickup. It's a 2004 model. 314-630-9463. Uh, sewing machine in good shape. 636-575-4258. Uh, let's see, a Suzuki, a Suzuki Winch, $150. Uh, also, they have uh, some pink camo, uh, looking for some Flintstone cookie jars. 573-764-4435. And uh, let's see what else I have here. Um Looking to buy some egg cartons uh, and coffee cans. Uh, also, I think they provide home health care. Uh, number here, 573-617-9109. 573-617-9109. Uh, here's a recumbent bike for $100. Also a Green Mountain Smoker for $300. 636-485-5824. 636-485-5824. Five eight two four, and I think as I look around, um, make sure I don't have anything else here on the back side. Two thousand five Holiday fifth wheel, twenty nine feet with a sixteen foot slide, good tires. Uh, six three six five eight four fifty sixty, six three six five eight four five zero six zero or. Um, 636-629-1268, 636-629-1268. Uh, some Indian figurines, color glass, uh, a bunch of record albums, and a Bowflex, 573-259-9448, 573-259-9448. And I think that's all I've got. Uh, and again, uh, I apologize for not being able to take any calls, but uh, we just don't have anybody available to answer the phone and uh, one thing I'm going to do here I need you to uh, well hear this from uh, Jerry's uh, TV sales and service um, we'll probably get a couple other things in here while I'm trying to get the zoom meeting straightened out uh, so stay with us and uh, we'll be uh, right back after you hear a couple things coming your way first off from Jerry's RCA Pre-wash clothes and other items right in the washer with a convenient built-in water faucet that gives you easy access to an instant water stream. A Whirlpool top load washer with a 360 wash agitator keeps clothes moving to provide a thorough clean in a variety of water levels. For mattresses, furniture, flooring, and appliances, see the folks at Jerry's TV and Home Furnishings at 375 West Springfield in Sullivan or call 468-4300. What makes a world champion cheese? 
Hello, I'm Megan Grebner with Healthy Living on Brownfield. The World Championship Cheese Contest is hosted every two years by the Wisconsin Cheesemakers Association. With more than 3,300 entries this year, it's deemed the Olympics of cheese. Tim Omer with Emmy Roth Cheese, a prior winner, shares what makes cheese a champion. First of all, make a quality product. I mean, that's really at the end of the day, when you're talking about the dairy farmer, I think that's a competitive advantage that we have in the Midwest is that we have, my opinion, is the best milk globally. I think if you can focus on quality, you have a quality product, and that starts with, obviously with the milk, and really focus on doing the best you possibly can, being the best cheesemaker you can, you're going to be successful. And if you can, um, and my, my advice would be to win. He says their competition victory has significantly impacted their business. Since we won the competition, we actually purchased another cheese plant in uh, near Green Bay, Wisconsin. So we have manufacturing in Platteville, Wisconsin, Monroe, Wisconsin, and then also Seymour, Wisconsin. So we bought another cheese plant. All of our cheese plants, we have three in the state of Wisconsin, all are filled up. And um, we're actually just built a conversion facility in Stoughton, Wisconsin. And like I mentioned previously, our business since we won the competition has more than doubled. I'm Megan Grabner with Healthy Living on Brownfield. Have you ever met a nematode? While individuals compete in track and field events, there's often a team component to the standings, with points awarded for each team member. All right. Uh, well, I wasn't able to get the uh, the Zoom all figured out uh, with uh, with all the new settings and stuff. So uh, I do have, I believe, we got this all worked out here, um, and uh, try to make sure that uh, they are on here. Okay, hang on just a second. And all right. Uh, all right. Ladies, are you there? All right, let me try this. Hang on. All right, now we'll try it. Ladies, are you there? We're here. Okay, great. Uh, finally, something worked today. Uh, this is April McDonald and Rachel Saltzman from Missouri Baptist Solvent Hospital. They are registered dietitians. And it is National Nutrition Month, and these ladies are going to give us uh, some very helpful information uh, about National Nutrition Month. Uh, whoever, whichever one of you wants to go first, uh, tell us a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Well, good morning. This is, uh, this is Rachel Saltzman. Um, so just kind of looking at our National Nutrition Month theme this year. Every year they pick a new theme. Um, this year it's beyond the beyond the table, so kind of thinking beyond what's just on our plates um, as we're eating and kind of the long-term impact on what we're eating, not only on our health, but on our environment as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of things go into that, kind of looking at focusing on, you know, healthy eating routines outside of the typical supper table and also, you know, when you're going out to eat, planning ahead to make some healthy choices. Um, you know, doing a grocery list, paying attention to sales, um, and also just learning where about where our food comes from. So going to local farmers markets, talking to farmers. Um, I know we're a pretty rural community, so a lot of people are already growing um, their own fruits and vegetables in their gardens, um, but just encouraging any and everyone to doing more of that. Um, even if you don't have a lot of space, herbs and lettuce are always easy to grow at home. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about the overall theme for National Nutrition Month this year. Well, now, you mentioned the gardens. I'm glad you brought that up. Now, with the uh, the COVID pandemic a few years back, uh, did you guys notice more people starting to uh, uh, go back to the grow your own food? I know back in my younger days, years ago, people were kind of self-sufficient. Uh, they tried to have... Uh, gardens at their homes, uh, you know, back when you had a little bit more uh, bigger yards or whatever, they try to put in gardens or, uh, you know, at least know somebody where they could get some fresh vegetables. Have people kind of gone back to that a little bit since the pandemic? Um, this is April, so good morning. Yeah. Um, back in 2020, I guess, when the pandemic started, so maybe that following summer 2021, I was still working an outpatient, and I did notice a little bit of a, an uptick in people um, doing their own gardens. Um, even people who didn't have much space in their yard were doing um, uh, 
container gardening, um, putting you know smaller plants out instead of the big garden, a few tomato plants, lettuce in in um, in uh, like big five gallon buckets or mm -hmm. even tubs or something. But but yeah, there was a little bit more of that going on. I think I even was doing it. All right, and and again, the, now do people have to be a little careful if, if they're doing that, you know, maybe raising a few tomatoes, some peppers, you mentioned lettuce, uh, a, a few other things. Uh, do you have to be careful what you're putting on? I know, you know, you got to worry about bugs, so there there's pesticides and things like that to, to put out there. Uh, so give us, can you give us some, uh, uh, some helpful hints maybe as far as making sure that that homegrown food is, is clean and is safe to eat? Uh, I might have to consult with my local horticulturist for something <laughs> yeah. like that. However, it's always a good idea to thoroughly wash everything, um, whether you grow it in your own backyard or, or you purchase it at the store. It's, it's a really good idea to, to wash things um, carefully. And I know here at the hospital in our kitchen, we have a special fruit and vegetable wash that we use to, to wash all of our stuff. Um, at home, I usually just put a little bit of soap on my on my foods and and rinse them off good just make sure you've got them uh the soap rinsed off and i think that's something people really don't think a lot about when they buy things at the grocery store i i would imagine your average consumer says oh it's clean i can just you know chop it up slice it up cut it up cook it and eat it uh but uh, as you mentioned it's probably a good idea to give it a pretty good uh, give it a pretty good cleaning before you start preparing it well you hear all the time about um you know, what, what was the last one? Cantaloupes were recalled. Um, yeah. You know, and we don't necessarily think of washing the outside of a cantaloupe because we don't eat the outside of a cantaloupe. But if you take a knife, you know, that knife is going to be on the, the outer part of the cantaloupe and it's going to slice through the rest of it, which can contaminate the inside. So even though we don't normally think of washing something like that, a, a, an outside of a fruit or vegetable that we're not going to eat, it's still a good idea. Okay. Uh, what are some other things you'd like to talk about today? Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, really um, just kind of have some overall, uh, kind of circling back to our National Nutrition Month theme. Um, they're just kind of, they have a whole bunch of just overall healthy eating tips. And I, um, so I work primarily with our outpatients um, here at Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital. Um, so, and I think a lot of these themes, um, you know, I see people coming to me for a variety of reasons, but I think I circle back to a similar themes for most people, um, kind of starting with, um, you know, eating breakfast, you know, the old, you know, the most important meal of the day, um, it really is, you know, it gets us off to a good start, um, trying to make sure we're incorporating as many of those fruits and veggies as we can at our meals, um, you know, make, trying to make at least half of our plate fruits and vegetables. Um, and just, you know, continuing to stay active. Um, you know, this time I think spring will finally come. I'm hopeful <laughs> yeah. anyways. Uh, <laughs> um, but just, you know, getting that, getting that outdoor activity. Um, you know, the overall goal is about 30 minutes for at least five days a week. Um, and, you know, we can do that in increments. It doesn't have to be all at one time. Okay. Uh, you uh, you talked about, you know, the uh, the healthy eating and things like that. You mentioned breakfast. Um, a lot of people, well, you know, I'll, I'll grab a, a fast food sandwich or, or something like that. Uh, what are the components of a, of a balanced breakfast that can really uh, not just give us that little quick uh, boost to start off our day, but will last a little while longer, kind of get us through the morning to our next meal without having that little, uh, you know, that uh, little uh, breakfast downturn or, you know, the withdrawal or whatever you want to call it. Uh, uh, what are some things we can incorporate in our breakfast on a regular basis that will kind of spread that energy out a little bit farther in the morning? I feel like um, most people don't get enough protein at breakfast. Uh, we're used to eating something like uh, cereal or toast. Um, sometimes people, you know, on the weekends especially, will have pancakes or waffles. Um, but have, none of those have very much protein. They're mostly carb-based. So um, I, in the morning, I like to eat um, a container of, of Greek yogurt. Um, that's got a really good amount of protein in it. I know some people who will even eat cottage cheese in the morning. It's mm -hmm. more of a, it's not a sweet thing, which we tend to eat more in the mornings. It's more of a savory type thing, but it's really packed with good amounts of protein. And then you can even look at your old reliable eggs. 
Um, they're a great source of protein. Um, I like to tell people that the egg white is actually the most bioavailable form of protein our body can get, meaning that's, that's the kind of protein our, real, our body really likes to um, absorb. So hard-boiled eggs can be eaten, scrambled eggs. Um, fried eggs are fine, too, as long as you're frying them in something other than bacon grease. Um, although that <laughs> yeah. is what tastes the best. Um, but, but I think what most people need to, to do is, is add a bit more protein to their diet okay. at, at breakfast. Now, what, for those people out there who uh, maybe uh, have a little affinity to the taste of, of uh, Greek yogurt, um, you know, is it okay to, to add a few things in, like some fresh fruit or something like that, to, uh, to help kind of uh, maybe take that, uh, make that taste a little bit more bearable? I mean, I, I eat the, um, the flavored Greek yogurt. This morning I had a, one of the little containers that was a mixed berry flavored Greek okay. yogurt. As long as it's... You know, as long as it's um, I mean, I, I typically go for the non-fat, um, about 100 calories or less per container. Um, if you are going to, um, if you're going to eat the uh, plain Greek yogurt, um, I like to do that with some fruit, uh, either you know fresh or frozen, um, and a little drizzle of honey. That's always Ooh, good too. Yeah. Okay. A little drizzle. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get too carried away. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, just add a little bit of sweetness to it. Yeah, that, that, that right. sounds good. Uh, okay, so uh, what's the best way to, to get a hold of you ladies? Uh, where is this information available for our listeners for the National Nutrition Month? National Nutrition Month information can be found on the Academy in Nutri of Nutrition and Dietetics website. Um, their address um, is very simple. It's eatright.org. Um, eat right is all one word. Um, anything else? I I don't have anything else. Uh, if you let, unless you ladies have something else you'd like to share. I think uh, one thing I'd just like to share is um, if you wouldn't mind sending our well wishes to Sam. Okay, we will sure do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, that is uh, April McDonald, Rachel Salzman, the uh, written registered dietitians at uh, Missouri Baptist Sullivan Hospital. It's National Nutrition Month. Ladies, thanks for your time this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm, have a great have day. Have a great day. All right. We thank them for joining us uh, here this morning. I uh, appreciate them uh, kind of bearing with me here. Uh, we currently have 31 degrees as we warm up, expecting a high today, low 40s. Clear tonight, low around 27, sunshine, a high of 66, so a nice warm-up tomorrow. A little bit cooler on Wednesday, back down to 57, and then we do have a slight chance of uh, maybe a little bit of rain Thursday afternoon and later Thursday night uh, with temperatures around 55 for the high on Thursday. Happy birthday today to Ann Carroll, Kay Bilo, Sally Salings, and Gilberta Record. Uh, thanks to Corporal Dallas Thompson for joining me earlier today and then for uh, April McDonald and Rachel Salzman uh, for the visit here uh, for the last few minutes. Uh, again, uh, that'll do it for me. I'll be back with you uh, for, the, uh, for the time being. I'll be sitting in for Sam while he is uh, recovering and rehabbing. Uh, so we uh, hope you'll uh, uh, join me each and every uh, day. Uh, we'll be back here at 6 o'clock uh, with uh, more news and everything. Uh, again, uh, you know, give blood, whether it's uh, Red Cross or whatever other organization in your area uh, has the blood drives. Uh, blood is desperately needed by uh, pretty much all those, uh, those national blood uh, centers. Uh, so help out, uh, give blood. Uh, say a prayer for the uh, first responders, uh, for the uh, firefighters and ambulance and police, highway patrol, sheriff's deputies, uh, for the... Uh, those in our armed forces that are serving here in our nation and around the world, uh, helping to protect our freedoms. Uh, pray for your uh, local government officials, county, state, uh, federal governments as well. And, and, and while you're at it, uh, uh, put Sam and his family uh, in your prayers as well as he is uh, working to recover from his stroke. I'll be back with you again uh, tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Until then, have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we now... Uh, rejoin our regular programming. I believe, uh, let's see if uh, Mike Gallagher is here. With news on Missouri Net, I'm Marshall Griffith.
The main expansion work on I-70 in Missouri will begin this summer, but preliminary work begins tonight, weather pending. Crews will begin drilling core samples of old pavement and the geology underneath along I-70 as part of the planning for the $2.8 billion project. MoDOT Director Patrick McKenna says the project is moving quickly and is ahead of the normal pace for interstate highway work. It would typically take two to three years, maybe as many as three to five years, to go from funded status to project on the ground on the interstate. It's very complicated to get these things done. The Missouri Attorney General's office is pursuing fraud charges against a software developer in Greene County. The suspect owns Bearded Dev Ops and faces one